Hey everybody. This is Mission Impossible in review. Tim went to go fix his chair, but now he's back, and I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> Welcome everybody to Kinda Funny's Mission Impossible in review. You might notice the keen-eared listeners out there will notice that that intro is different. Oh. This was back in the day. Mission Impossible in review, if you guys remember was done in the last studio. Yeah. Um, that's Whoa. how long ago this was. This oh, was yeah. not even a pandemic in review. This was us in the studio all the way up to Fallout. Um, and that was back when we didn't have the amazing Carter Harrell to do our custom intros. So uh, I had him go back uh, a while ago and make it. And I hit up Cameron Kennedy today and boom, we have that magic there. Bam, so, how about that? Shout out to them. Bam, how about, how about, about that? that? Um, of course, this is Kind of Funny's In Review, where each and every week we get together to rank, review, and recap different movie franchises. And the people doing that, of course, are me, Tim Geddes, joined by the Nitro Rifle, Andy Cortez. Hey, everybody. It's Christmas in June for just a couple more days. Joey Noel. Hello. Rounding out the group today, Nick Scarbino. Hello, Timothy. Hello, Nicholas. Um, of course, you can get the show on YouTube.com slash kind of funny or roosterteeth.com. You could also get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for kind of funny in review, and we will be right there for you. Um, I realize as I'm saying this, we're recording this out of time. We got to see an early screener. So this so is early. actually posting like two weeks after um, we, we're recording it. So it will be Christmas in July. Oh, okay. Joey Noel. Thank you for yes. the correction. I, I know that the. Keen-eared listeners will also appreciate that. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Remember, you can go to patreon.com slash kindoffunny to get the show ad-free and watch live as we record it, just like our Patreon producer, Nathan Lamoth, has done. Uh, we appreciate you so very, very much. Um, I want to get into some fun stuff. Mm. Mission Impossible. It's been a while. Real quick. Been a while. Realize this. My first Mission Impossible in theaters. Wow. Oh. No. Yeah. Because l- what we right. did in review, and I had never seen any of them before. Wow. And that was after Fallout had come that's out. Right. So, so that's cool. And more importantly than that, as time has changed and things have shifted, <laughs> Joey's joining us for the first time here. And oh, yeah. Joey, what's your history with the Mission Impossible franchise? I've watched them all in the last week and a half. Woo! For the first time. <laughs> yeah, Hell for the yeah. first time. I'm sure like, I've seen parts of one, maybe the whole part, of, may- but nothing that I remember. And I'm sure it's just been like the key, like fun things. I know, especially when you guys did it before, a lot of conversations. More importantly, Joe, now you'll notice that guaranteed, Uh anytime you stay in a hotel, Uh there's a Mission Impossible (laughs) somewhere playing on cable. Whether it's the USA Network or FX, Mm -hmm. there will always be a Mission Impossible playing wherever. If you're in a hotel right now, I guarantee you, go turn on the TV, take a photo, send it to Tim, and you'll see... That He's Mission good. Impossible is playing right now it's somewhere. Always Mission Impossible too. No Rogue oh. Nation. I saw Ooh. Rogue Nation several times. Angle's really? protocol. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna be in a hotel next week, so yeah. I will try it out. Um, the thing I I've had a lot of fun with all of these. One surprise held, holds up. It's a fun movie. It, it does feel a little bit dated, but uh, it still held my attention. Two, eh, a little bit less so. Three, shockingly. Top of my list, probably. I just spit everywhere. Very good movie. Um, you get a little bit of the rom-com action. It's. I feel like it's a good melding of everything. Plus, you have uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman. How do you Ooh. not love Philip Seymour Great Hoffman? Villain. Maybe the greatest villain in the entire series, kind of without a doubt. Yeah. Uh, then, I will say Mission Impossible, the most I've ever liked Jeremy Renner in anything. He's fantastic. He's so good. <clears throat> what can be said about all of these set pieces, the climbing on the thing, mm. like hanging off the rock even in two and stuff. It's just like, this is really fun. Yeah. Um, and then Fallout. My, my biggest issue is I know them by numbers. I don't know them by name. So I feel- Those protocols four. Okay. The Mission Possible three is just Mission, Mission Possible three. three. Okay. Those protocols four, Rogue Nations five, Fallout six. six. Okay. I feel like I mix up four and five. Everyone does. Because it's whenever they have two names and they're all kind of like- it's also they're very cool and interchangeable. Let's be honest, they're very generic. Yeah, like could be a double A video game name. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like what yeah. year of Call of Duty? Exactly. exactly, exactly. To me, I just know Ghost Protocol's Brad Bird. That was like such a place in time for me. That was uh, probably st- still one of my favorite. Like it's so hard to rank these freaking movies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just always think of how much fun I have with the gadgetry in the hallway with the screen and the yeah. projector and all that stuff the the climbing of the uh the Burj Khalifa 
the hallway sequence when we're dealing like, oh my gosh, it, it, our, it, they're in the different floor, but we have yeah. to pretend like they're over there. They got the camera there. in the eyes. They got to blink to, oh my God, dude, mm. what a freaking movie. But then Fallout, good Lord. When that yeah. when you watch that shit in Blu-ray, Joe, and then it, sh- it changes to the IMAX oh. sequence, you know when he flies time. out of the airplane. Oh my God, dude. So, so cool. Even last night after we watched uh, Dead Reckoning, I went back and I you had sent me the clip of them doing the plane stunt from fallout right so i was watching that behind the scenes and then i went back and watched the behind the scenes of the shot the motorcycle shot from this one i was like damn tom cruise just <laughs> really giving us everything he got fully committed what a terrifying man <laughs> you gotta love it you really gotta love it uh today we are talking about mission impossible dead reckoning part one what a freaking name Dead reckoning, motherfuckers, dude. Uh, this one had a runtime of two hours and 43 minutes, um, significantly longer than even the longest of the Mission Impossibles thus far. Um, it came out, it was coming out on July 12th, 2023. It's the first film in the series since Mission Impossible 2 to not involve J.J. Abrams in any capacity. Hmm. Uh, that is interesting. Hmm. Um, a direct sequel, part two, or Dead Reckoning part two, is set to be released on June 28th, 2024, and there's not a chance in hell that that actually happens. Like, they're shooting a lot back-to-back and stuff, but like they're nowhere close to done with that. The writer's strike, actor's strike, looming, all this stuff. It ain't happening, y'all. But we will be back doing it in this re- in review eventually, whenever it does come out. Uh, this was once again directed by Christopher McQuarrie. He made his directorial debut with the crime thriller film The Way of the Gun in the year 2000, which I have not seen. That Never, sounds like a it, badass name. Um, it doesn't hold up, unfortunately. Damn. Yeah, it's a, it's a Ryan Philippi Benicio oh, Del Toro movie. I like both of them. Uh, it's kind of a modern-day gunslinger that I, I remember really liking when I was uh, younger, and then I think I went back and watched it like two, three years ago, and I was like, oof, this is, this is rough, but mm. it's an interesting it, concept, very very genre film. If you want people to take you seriously, you have to say it's a Ryan Philippi and Benicio Del Toro vehicle. Oh, but, well, I don't know. I don't know, if, I don't know if they were looking to ship those two as a, <laughs> as a pair. <laughs> They've always He's worked a, together. He's a the hot collaborator. In 2000. A frequent collaborator with Tom Cruise, having written and directed the action films Jack Reacher in 2012. Which, Jack Reacher. First one. The movie, really good. Good. Yeah. Shocking Second one. Made for TV film. Yeah. Yeah. Very not weird. great. Not but good. the first one, one of the most like surprising movies I've watched where I was like, not, I would think I saw it with my dad. I was like, oh, I was not expecting to care about this and pleasantly. I need, I need to watch it. I know that everybody says it's like an action must, similar to the extraction movies with uh, Chris. Have you seen it yet? No. We got to do it, man. Everyone's yeah. talking about this extraction stuff. I watched the first five minutes of extraction. The first one, I was like, ah. Oh, well, good. apparently, extraction two is like, is it? A it is must longer? watch. I, okay, I'll give it a watch. I love Chris Hemsworth. Like, my, like mindless action, but like incredibly well directed and fun and awesome. Because I tell you what, I started, action. I started watching that uh, Ryan Gosling, uh, the Gray Man. Yeah, I was Not like, what, what's going on here? What is yeah. this? Yeah. Isn't no. a mess. Um, so we also directed Rogue Nation, Fallout, uh, and the upcoming next two, Dead, or Dead Reckoning and Dead Reckoning Part Two. I, I like that Tom Cruise calls him McHugh. McHugh, it's, it's I so, think it's, it's so, so cute, cool, man. Yeah, so They're just cute. like buds. <laughs> um, and then, in addition to producing the latter three, while also being part of the writing and/or producing team on the films Valkyrie in 2008, Edge of Tomorrow in 2014, oh, Jack Reacher Never Go Back one. in 2016, uh, and then Top Gun Maverick in 2020, uh, which he received Academy Award nominations for Best Adapted screenplay and best picture and he's a fucking badass he also has a podcast that is absolutely incredible the way that he talks about movies whether it's the ones he's making or others work is he is a talent among i love that uh so definitely go check that out joe you need to watch edge of tomorrow is that the one that went through the name chain yes with them okay yeah it It was was, uh, uh, live die repeat repeat for a while because people can i book your theater for that (laughs) yeah 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 i have it on blu-ray it's really good edge of tomorrow is fun we gotta do it movie um, and the music was done once, or not once again, done by Lauren Balf, um, who did Fallout, and uh, the show's composer and musical director for the Game Awards Orchestra. Oh, that wow. Was, uh, that's fun. So I got to see this guy, and that's he was cool. fucking awesome, yeah. and it was just so cool. I'm like, oh my God, it's the Mission Impossible guy. So, hell yeah. And the score in this film in particular, oh man, oh man, it's good. It's damn good. Yeah. Um, this one had a budget of $290 million, a box office that we don't know yet because it's not out. Um, but yeah, that is all of the stats and all of the things. Andy Cortez, I want to start with you on your thoughts on Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. Part one. Bit disappointed. Huh. Mm. Bit disappointed. And uh, I think that comes from me just loving three through six as much as I do and, and thinking that Including part one, I'd say that throw that in there as well. Like, I think this is probably my favorite action franchise of all time. 
Um, and uh, I, I felt like if you told me Christopher McQuarrie had nothing to do with this movie, I'd believe it. This mm. felt like it, it like it felt like it didn't follow a formula that I wanted it to follow. It felt kind of like they were taking a different approach to um, when I think of um, I've, I've talked about it in like video game uh, reviews before, but intro, verse, pre-chorus, chorus, very like. We're used to kind of like those notes, and I feel like this movie started off kind of oddly paced uh, and never quite found its footing for me. So I'm going to say that it's disappointing. However, Tim, however. Real quick, I should have said this at the top. Full spoilers, everybody. Full so, spoilers. Do not watch this if you do not want to be spoiled. However, like, I, I mean, I, that doesn't mean that I didn't have a good time. I still had a good time with it. I'm just expecting the level of Fallout and those like final three movies. Um, I think that this, watching this in the theater, in Dolby in particular, the sound design, the score, um, I, was, it, I was telling Nick that you could play Lauren Balfe's score over me shopping for Hot Cheetos at a fucking CVS and it's going to be entertaining. Yeah. Because they're just, it's, it's so tense and it's so good. And I'm a sucker for somebody walking down a hallway and somebody's walking after them and they don't know. And does they, do they have the package or the like? I'm just a sucker for the, for things like that in general. And I think that this team in particular does it so well. Um, I I kind of wish that we would have had Nicholas Holt as the bad guy because Nicholas Holt was had a, a scheduling issue and was supposed to take the role of Gabriel. And oh, they, interesting. And they no, he would have been he would have been the exact like oh that would have been good. And been and good. yeah, it, I, huh. I I did find it odd what they did with the villain and kind of like he's a he's a vi he's a ghost of the past, but it's nobody that we've seen before in past yeah. Mission Impossible movies, which I thought was kind of an odd angle to take. Um, I I this movie you just, had a ghost protocol right there. <laughs> <laughs> this movie just felt like really out of balance for me. Um. But again, that you know, I think the action set pieces were still really fun and awesome and well directed and loud as shit. But man, like they they just did such a good job of making those action set pieces feel tense. They nailed the tension where it needed to be nailed. Um, this movie is just there's so many like video game and Metal Gear references, like. Anything with the AI, uh, when the AI talks to Simon Pegg, I'm like, oh my God, this is oh sons of, uh, like, this is uh, I have Flying Scissors 61 when the colonel's just going buck wild. This movie just had a lot of those moments that I really, really enjoyed. Um, still a bit of a disappointment, but I'd say if you're a Mission Impossible fan, still watch it in theaters, you're going to have a good time because it's loud and it's fun and action packed. I just wish that there was, um, I just wish that there was a bit more creativity in certain reveals and certain moments that kind of when i think of the uh wolf, wolf blitzer moment in mm, fallout yeah. oh, like moments like that i didn't quite have in this movie and i was wanting those like what the fuck no way kind of things to happen in the theater unfortunately were uh not so present for me but i still enjoyed it nick uh, i'm i'm with andy on this one i might be a bit lower than you are um i i found beginning to be good i think it dragged a little bit in the toward the end of the first act and the middle act for me i was like once we get to the airport, I, I was kind of, I was like, I don't, there's too many things going on here for me really to focus on and none of it's fun. And then it picked back up in the third act. Um, I would say the, the thing that really got me and it's, and it's your point is that the movie just doesn't, it doesn't build on what came before it tonally. It doesn't feel fun. It doesn't feel like we have a, a great team dynamic. Like what I loved about fallout was that we're in this incredibly tense situation and like, everyone's in it together and Benji's there to provide some comic relief, but we're driving toward like the climax of the movie. And this one just kind of felt all over the place. It had a lot of characters in it and a lot of, and some of them <laughs> kind of felt like they weren't all in the same movie. Like if you like Shea Wiggum, I know you love Shea Wiggum. Fucking love him. Felt Sorry, really. Who's he? He's the guy that's after Ethan the, the entire oh, time. Oh yeah. Yeah. The guy that I always think is Steve Zahn. But yeah. 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 Man, so, God. And I love <laughs> Steve Zahn. Yeah. <laughs> um, he is, brings a certain vibe to it. And then Palm Clementif is like not even in the same movie as everyone else. We're like, yeah. why is she Harley Quinn in this? What, we in She's fucking cool. She was awesome. Yes. I mean, all these all, all these elements are good, but when you put them all together, I think they just unfortunately didn't come together for me. And I think for me, 
it, it's less about the action set pieces, which I would argue actually weren't some of the, I actually don't think they were that great. Truth be told, even the, even the big stunt that we were all leading up to, I was like, that kind of let me down a little bit, but that's I'm not with my, you there. I'm with you there. Um, the car sequence we've seen before. I'll talk about the train. <laughs> the train, I think but the train cool. stuff we've seen before, like we literally has, have seen that train sequence where the things are coming out their head before in, in mission. Oh, Bible I One. mean like the whole thing falling at the end. Though. That was, like, that, that part was, was a different, that part was interesting. Yeah. Um, but I will say the thing that really struck me as, as disappointing was I thought the, I thought this movie was overly written, which is not a, it's not a criticism I've really ever had of another action movie. What do you mean overly written? Every single scene had too much dialogue in it, too much exposition, mm -hmm. too many characters, too many times they're telling you that this thing is the worst thing ever. And after a certain point, like we have that one scene that was like, we saw in the trailer where he throws the bomb, which is so cool. But why did that scene have smoke nine it. people in it? Was it just because, um... If I, well, first off, Warlock was in it. Shout out to Warlock. Come the fuck, come on. Which is great. <laughs> but it, it really felt like Tom Cruise was like, who can we get that that I owe, that I just love being around? Can we get yeah. like Harry Elways, all these people? I'm like, it didn't need to be that many people. But they're just sitting there telling you guys like, and AI, like here's what AI is. Why is it so bad? Here's why it's so bad. This is what's good. And I'm like, we're, you guys are really telling me a lot about why. An unlimited world power capable of doing all this stuff with no means to an end. Like everybody right. kind of had it. No, it, it was the most one, Metal Gear shit cut popping over the codec. Again, and it worked. Again, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. And again, if you're to people, if you if you're playing a Metal Gear game, you're getting what you're you want, right? That's that's Metal Gear. You expect that. You're playing Metal Gear. Like this is going to be overly ridiculous. Characters are going to come out of nowhere. There's going to be a character from the past that we've never seen before, but it's from Snake's past, <laughs> right? All that stuff. But Mission Impossible is a little bit more self-aware than that usually, right? Like let's think back to like the rabbit's foot, for instance, where they're like, we don't even give a shit what this thing is. It's just a MacGuffin. It's just a reason to get Ethan and the team from point A to point B to point C to point B, and then we're done with the movie, right? This one just felt like they were like, we really don't. We, we really want to drive home why AI is so bad. It's obviously a meta commentary what's happening in the world today, but it kind of felt like chat GPT wrote this movie because there's moments where I was like, does every scene need to be a close up and have Ethan be like, oh my God, it's the entity. It just all felt such like such a slog after a while for me. And I'm like, where's the fun of the witty repartee back and forth between him and Benji and Jeremy Rayner and all these characters and all the, and, and the team dynamic. So by the time we got halfway through this, I was just like, and then adding Haley Atwell into the team, who's this character that even the character doesn't want to be in the movie, yeah. felt really, really, really dragged down for me. So by the time we get to the train sequence, I was like, I'm kind of ready for this movie to be over. Andy? I just wanted to say that a lot of those close-up sequences and a lot of moments in this movie really felt like Christopher McCord wanted to pay an homage to part one. Absolutely. Running. It felt like a Brian like, Palmer movie. Like, for sure. Like uh, uh, the sequences at, at night running through the f very, very foggy mm -hmm. European country, you know, that uh, had a lot of vibes of part one. But the those close up shots you're talking about where it's still a close up, but it might just change framing <laughs> in it's a like, different it's way. It's always just a little more that diagonal angle. than yeah. anyone else would do it. <laughs> and, and, and it's like it's constantly shifting. And that reminds me so much of what part one did. And this kind of felt like Chris McCoy trying to do that. And that's why I felt like if you told me McHugh had nothing to do with this movie, I would have believed you. Because like it, it felt like it was made by a different team in, in some ways. I agree. It felt like they brought Brian De Palma back <laughs> to direct this movie because it and and that was I guess that's my that's that's another disappointment was just that it just it, it felt like they were really wanted to make an intense movie. Obviously, it's part one. They're driving toward potentially the end of this incredibly grand epic series, so they wanted to take it very seriously. But a lot of it came off as really campy and kind of just melodramatic at points. Um, and I think that's because they any tension they built, if you don't have a diffuser for that, if you don't have some comic relief, if you don't remind the audience that, hey, this is actually an adventure and it's supposed to be fun, um, I think it just gets stale toward the end. Joey. I think I'm a little bit higher than both of you. <clears throat> I still had a great time. There are criticisms that you both have made that I think stand. I do think that there are like a lot of characters in this movie and it's a lot to keep track of. I think Palm Clementine as cool as she or some of her parts were, I think she was like, un I didn't care enough about her because I think that there's just not enough screen time for me to care this enough about like her. like three words. Yeah. Ex well, yeah. And like, j especially compared to like how much screen time and we get to spend with like Vanessa Kirby and Haley Atwell. I'm like, I just don't have the brain capacity <laughs> to like add another character essentially into this movie. Um, but I thought it was really fun. I don't normally like Haley Atwell very much, and I think this is the most I've kind of liked her in a movie. I don't dislike Haley Atwell. Yeah. I just feel like they didn't really do, like 
her character was really weird for me because I think it was supposed to be like a newer character who was supposed to be somewhat innocent to this world. Mm -hmm. But they set her up as being, she has like nine passports. She's an international, she's like one of the best thieves on the planet. Yeah. And she's shocked that cops are coming after her all the time. And it's like, oh my God, I don't know how to deal with this. I'm like, I, I prefer the secondary characters in this to be more like Ilsa. Ilsa is a badass. She's got her own set of stills. She's very much Ethan's equal in a lot of ways, yeah. but she brings different a different dynamic to the table. And so it was like kind of weird to me. I was like, oh, I thought Haley was going to be like the side character. She ends up being the main yeah. kind of quasi love interest, which felt weird. Um, maybe I read that too much, but him him like grabbing her face and doing all these things, I was like, but Ilsa he just like died. all of them. <laughs> I feel like and right? it's weird, all of the... right? It's yeah. but but. But with Ilsa, we had a few movies to spend with her where we built that dynamic up. And so when we get to that moment where they're sort of like – they have that moment where they hold hands, which I thought was one of the only real beats of emotion in the movie. Um, you kind of get like, hey, we're actually friends in real life and like this we've done this thing together and like they have well, that – Well, and that's you know, like the, th the through line for the whole movie starting with like the bomb uh, – disabling the bomb at the airport. Right, my friends. My friends the most important stuff. thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I – the movie's really long. <laughs> I will long. say that, like, probably two hours and I looked at my phone and I'm like, oh, man, we still got, like, another 45 minutes left. Not that I wasn't having fun, but it would just, I think, I get, like, a little bit of, like, exhaustion in these, like, action movies after. It's like, oh, when we don't feel like we're making, like, that much more progress towards the end. It's like, oh, we have 45 minutes. Um, so that, the train scene in this, I thought was super fun and is probably, like, my favorite action piece of the whole thing. It feels very... uh uncharted ish and stuff like that and it was fun to see on screen uh i liked the motorcycle thing like even just rewatching the motorcycle behind the scenes stuff last night was just so cool um and yeah like uh i think what i appreciate most about this movie especially seeing it after seeing fast x is seeing a part one ending executed in a mm. good way where it's like you feel like this is a complete story and they like really hammer it home with like finding the key is only the first part but feeling like it's a satisfying movie ending, uh, but still wanting to see the rest of the story versus with Fast X, it's like, we don't know what's going to happen. And it, it doesn't feel as satisfying to me. Mm. So I do give the team like major props for that. Um, this movie is a lot campier than I was expecting, which normally is like a seller for me, but some of it just felt a little bit weird. And I will say that Ving Rhames <laughs> and the Carrie Elwes like uh, train scene that he had, I thought were like, stood out as being like really not good like it to the point where the carrie elwes one i was like is this somebody in a mask <laughs> in like a voice changer that's yeah. like really off like it, there's I something it about it that, somehow yeah i, <laughs> I was, was like, like no. there was something about it that just felt really weird i'm like i don't i don't he's know he's such a is. video game character in this movie yeah, yeah. His, his line delivery is very like solid snake david hater type stuff which but at the beginning it didn't feel as like I feel like it flowed a little bit better. Mm. I don't know. He, he he read more as a politician in the beginning, and in this yeah. one, it's a little bit more like B movie villain. And yeah. to be fair, though, this has been a lot of camp and Mission Impossible, and let's not totally. forget how awesome Alec Baldwin was as their as their guy before. <laughs> sure, so he's great, but he's also silly and kind of yeah. ridiculous. But like when you say camp, do you mean like the? To me, the, the part that kind of stuck out as almost slack, slapstick was a little car sequence. Yeah, a hundred percent. I was like, where it's what like, are we doing here? I don't know how many times. Like, I get you guys are handcuffed, and I don't know how many like weird swaps and how many times we have to acknowledge like oh this isn't the way we wanted it but we're handcuffed it's like i don't know that this is what i expect from modern mission impossible i think it makes more sense in the earlier movies yeah um, but she seems to be established one. that she can not only pick a handcuff but she can do it at will whenever she wants mm -hmm. like why didn't you do something like that when we were driving whatever yeah tim what about you this movie was two hours and 43 minutes and it ends because it's a part one. If part two started right, then <laughs> I would have been fucking there and hyped out as my mind. A couple of weeks ago, we were watching The Flash, and there was a moment uh, in like the big final climax and whatever. It's quality of the movie, quality of the moments who gives a shit. There was one moment where some music was hitting, and my watch was like, Tim, your heart rate is high. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and I was like, wow, okay. At least the movie made me feel something. Um, Andy, right here. Your heart rate rose above 120 BPM while you seemed to be inactive for 10 minutes. <laughs> It happened nine times. <laughs> nine separate <laughs> times. That's, <laughs> last night. That's, That's incredible. Amazing. I had the time of my life watching this movie. I think a lot of the criticisms you guys are lobbying at this are absolutely fair and apt and totally make sense. But a lot of them worked for me in this movie. Mm. I feel like this very much was a Chris McHugh 
take on the old school type of Mission Impossible. And through that lens, I thought they absolutely accomplished what they were going for. It had me the entire time. It's not my favorite. It's not even close to my favorite. I actually think we're going to end up ranking this pretty much at the same spot. Um, I do think, though, that this is with the good ones. I think that it is like uh, in that same realm. Um, but the things that I love most about Mission Impossible and the reason that Rogue Nation is still my favorite is I like Jeremy Renner. I like Benji being a real character for a lot of the movie and the dynamics of the team. The dynamics of this team, there's some interesting things. Killing off Ilsa the way that they did. I'm like, I don't know about this. I did love Haley Atwell. I did love Palm. I loved the new characters. I just didn't necessarily love replacing the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just getting to a point where there's a lot going on. And uh, it is so funny watching this so close to Fast 10, yeah. which um, a lot of similarities. It being a part one, it being a part Rome. of a, 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 a Rome <laughs> set piece that has- They literally very, had the stairs. The very stairs. similar cars <laughs> driving downstairs. I dollar for every time things. this summer we watched cars rolling downstairs. Totally. But I think that um, there's pros and cons to each one. And I yeah. think that despite Fast 10 having a lot of issues and just fucking ending and that not working at all whereas this it ends and i'm with joey like i felt like there was a complete movie here um i feel like the team dynamic and even though there's too many characters in fast and all that i care about the characters and their interactions a lot more than i care about the majority of characters in the mission impossible universe and the ones i care about most are gone <laughs> or at least like being part of the core team i'm like mm -hmm. so because of that i feel like this could never be that high for me but I love the little car set piece. I feel like that was the perfect blend between the old and the new, and that w was where the levity in this movie kind of came. I'm totally with Andy. I love the clever moments. I love the reveals of like the the recordings were someone else or like they're in the same room and all that. This movie just doesn't have that, and that is kind of a bummer. But what it does have is the threat of this AI that is going to work for some and not work for others. It really worked for me. I mm. love it being the bad guy. The moment that it takes over <clears throat> and is uh, Simon Pegg's voice telling uh ethan to go the wrong ways there's something so deeply scary about that and even in the airport scene where uh benji's trying to figure out the the code and it almost feels like it's in real time reacting to him um this ghost from the past where it's like he's only seen with the glasses because like the ai is like messing with the tech there's a lot of clever cool ass shit happening that i think part two is really going to bring out from this movie of like oh that's what was happening here that's what's happening here but it's in this movie and it's like i thought that stuff was really damn awesome um and yeah just the style of it was like a lot more playful than we're used to um, from a like a camera movement perspective there was some one shots in this and not even one shots just like the momentum of some of the action scenes of how the camera would work with the one-liners going to just all the the choreography i was just having a blast and comparing the dom rome um chase scene to this chase scene i love both of them equally but for very different reasons and i love that mission impossible knows action like no yeah. other franchise and post watching mission impossible now watching john wick um and especially john wick chapter four john wick. to me i think that is the pinnacle of, yeah. of what can be uh, accomplished in an action movie um and seeing this so close to that i feel like some of that lessens the the movie overall for me where i'm just like like, whoa, that is a 10. This isn't a 10, but like, goddamn, I loved it. And like, this was a, mm -hmm. such a fun time. I can't wait to watch it again. Um, but yeah, could have used a little bit more levity of the team, could have used more clever reveals and stuff. And I, I think all of us unanimously feel that the motorcycle jump just didn't feel epic. Like, maybe it's because we've seen the real version of it and the yeah. real behind the scenes seems a lot cooler. But like, something about the way it was executed was just kind of like, I ah, okay. I think the silence in the score too at that point was I didn't feel cool. I, I think it was the way it was kind of shot and directed. Um when we have him jumping out of the airplane fallout, and you get to sit in that moment and see his face. I know they probably didn't want to recreate the same sort of vibe, but it like what adds to the tension and the, the your feeling of like, oh my gosh, that's actually Tom Cruise is because you see that it's Tom Cruise and you see that it is not CG'd and that adds to like, oh my gosh, this is like even more intense because I know that this is this billion dollar actor doing these things that are just absolutely insane. I mean, 
the fact that he's just riding his motorcycle <laughs> is like yeah, we should feel that. Dude, there's a moment mountain. where he just goes like, not even that. It's the moment where he just pops up the little jump, and yeah. I was like, whoa, whoa, yeah, where are you going, Tom Cruise. Yeah, Slow it's, down, you it's, can roll an ankle. It's fucking insane. Um, but I th that shot was just you know jumping off the the thing. It's like we we're all waiting for that. We I think we maybe just kind of hyped it up too much for ourselves. I wish they didn't really hype it up in any way either and show us things to be excited about like if they would have just shown the like big ramp or not the ramp but like the thing that the he goes off of, but it, yeah yeah. yeah i think if they did like no pre-press for that we i still would have been hyped for this movie and i may have been more excited about it but i don't know i think like i'm still amazed by the the fucking stunt we've talked about it tons of times that, that he did that like eight times or something and so many things can go wrong and the you know the fact that it didn't, and I just don't think it was shot well enough for us to really feel that moment. So that moment, though, for as much of a letdown, it led into such an amazing sequence of him actually Incredible. like landing onto the plane and being yeah. pulled in. From that moment on, I was like, I am so into this. But for as dope as the train sequence was, it didn't f have that real feeling from Tom Cruise. Yeah. It felt like a Fast and Furious movie. A very, very, very good Fast and Furious mm -hmm. set piece, but it's CG fucking everywhere. And yeah. like this train's like fucking like falling off the cliff and stuff and they're trying to get up. And I'm like, this is great. But I feel like some of the things that make that, that ground the Mission Impossible and when it is the spectacle, but it's a real spectacle, yeah. that feels so much crazier. But like this to me kind of just was like, all right, I loved it, but it didn't feel real. It felt more just like entertainment. Him hanging off of the fucking bail and fallout mm -hmm. and grabbing onto it and you coming up with him and you and you get that feeling of like oh like that gut yeah that, that feeling yeah. in your gut as he's rising you're like well too late pass point of return those are real moments that only tom cruise really de like delivers and sadly there's just nothing like that in this movie there's one there is one second when we go off the cliff with him where you're like Ugh! and you see it that it's him and you go it's the drop where we go with him that was pretty incredible um I wish it had been not telegraphed as much as humanly. I wish he had come around and just seen it and been like, oh, I got it. And we just were just with him and yeah. didn't know it was coming. But we telegraphed that, to Joey's point, just so far ahead of the way. Mm -hmm. Granted, it was a fun little bit of back and forth between him and Benji. And those, but I was are, having, those are moments that I love, yeah. But I was having anxiety the entire time because I was like, wait a minute. You're in a self-driving car, Benji? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> this AI is going to kill you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I think, to talk to Andy's point, too, with... The, them going out of the plane and fallout you feel like you are with tom cruise doing it and this oh, is yeah. very much you are watching tom cruise do something so i feel like just we don't get those close-ups of yeah. like oh this is actually him in the sky and it's that would require another motorcycle in front of him with another camera person <laughs> another doing that. Motorcycle. Which I love is wild. Don't put it, don't <laughs> put it past that. Yeah. Not, not a drone and, and a like motorcycle. and, <laughs> and it, you know that's just that comes to the territory of of I, the best action star I've ever watched in my life, and I think that we'll ever watch in our lives, constantly wanting to one-up himself and do the next large stunt that is going to wow audiences and get asses in seats to sit in the theater and see these things that he's capable of pulling off. And you can only one-up yourself so many times until you kill yourself or you just end up kind of, you know, coming back down and like uh, there's lesser and lesser stunts that are still awesome and we should be wowed by anyway but um yeah if you are constantly trying to do that next big thing you're eventually going to disappoint somebody and i i still was wowed by the sun i just think it could have been shot and framed a little bit better i mean let's be perfectly honest can it get any cooler than piloting your own f-18 <laughs> no i mean i mean baby i guess the helicopter sequence in fallout helicopter was another one that pretty awesome that yeah, you had that same sort of that same feeling of danger and, oh, yeah. and inertia and speed and you see how close that, that and it's in the IMAX shot as well and he's getting close to these clips you're like god damn this man is insane yeah and uh and it's I mean put him in another helicopter and do another sequence like that I'm sure I'd probably be really really into it. Would have been okay with it um we're gonna take a quick word from our sponsors but when we get back we're gonna hit you with the plot this episode is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs make you look good. Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs use anti-stink sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. I've been going down to the heat of Los Angeles with Gia a lot recently, and I've been loving the breeze thanks to my Bird Dogs. They got Oxford shorts, khaki shorts, 
bathing suits, and much, much more. My favorites are the Art Farts Knockers. And it's not just because of the name, it's because of the blue. But hey, the name doesn't hurt at all. Art Fart Knocker, come on. Go to birddogs.com slash kind of funny or enter code kind of funny for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash kind of funny or use the promo code kind of funny for a free Yeti style tumbler. Birddogs.com slash kind of funny. Promo code kind of funny. <laughs> Here is the plot. Here is the plot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, so short. let's kick it. Let's kick it off with Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part One. And Tim, I want to tell you a little story before this Please happened. Do. I'm oh. sitting between my two favorite human beings on the mm-hmm. planet, uh, Andy Cortez, who waited me with me in the theater for 45 minutes beforehand because we were the first people About in this place. Three hours. Three hours. And Snow Mike Mike, who we co- it said six forty five. It says six. But, it says six. And then, then everyone seven thirty. But everyone afterwards. said to get there at six forty five because the screen was a screener. You said that ten movies ago, <laughs> not for this movie. What <laughs> about okay. tonight? What do we have to do tonight? Tonight six thirty. Exactly six forty five. Everyone we said 645. it. We did it for there. yesterday. <laughs> Somebody said it. I heard it. Andy you heard guys it too. Could have just come. Am I crazy? And had drinks with us across the street. Am I crazy? If I see when I see six forty five to ten. I know to be there at six. I want to be available at six forty-five, and I'm ready to rock at six forty-five. And sure. Joey replies to me, "You know this movie doesn't start until seven thirty. I was like, "Well, then why does the fucking calendar say six fucking forty-five? Because it says it says seven thirty. We were lied to. So it says two different times. Children. Yeah. We were lied to. Then why not just the one time? And 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 <laughs> the the comments on this video will vindicate us, Andy. And I, as will the comments on my hilarious Instagram post that I posted <laughs> last night. Anyway, it provided a, a great moment of levity for us because I got to con Mike Mike, who is notoriously late and or doesn't show up for things. I was like, you've got to get here. It's crazy Back, that bro. we can't save seats anymore. And after oh, yeah, the flash. You, you said that too. Didn't realize that it was <laughs> empty. Oh, yeah. We took full advantage of it. We're not yeah. mad. We just run to be assholes. Um, Mike sits down and he goes. How do you think this is gonna start, Jabroni? And I was like, I think they're gonna start with, I think they're gonna start with a motorcycle. I think he's gonna come right off the rip, and that's gonna be the first scene. And Mike's like, I think he's gonna start in a submarine. And sure as shit, ladies and gentlemen, we started at yeah. the USSR Sevastopol or whatever it is. The coolest, basically, we're going to call this the hunt for October because uh, I, I, I cannot remember Sevastopol, and I'm pretty sure that was the name of it, but who the yeah. heck knows? Uh, this is a yeah, super. Super secret military sub that's very silent and it's got this badass uh, brain to it that looks a little bit like a nuclear, like a, the little ball that's in the nuclear bombs. Mm. You know, it uh, like the ring. The ring. Yeah. Oh no, no, I'm talking about the actual, oh. the actual I thought you meant the badass like, sphere that this AI is sitting in. Got it. And then once we do see the AI, that I was like, that's cool. Somebody did their research for 1999 computer graphic uh, screensavers. That was pretty interesting. Did not like the design of any of the AI stuff. I was like, this is very weird for me. Anyway, uh, they program it, and they're like, oh, we got, this is an advanced AI. No one could ever see us. We are the best ship ever. We're 25,000 miles away from anything. And I don't know if you caught this part or not, but the captain goes, we're dead reckoning on path or some cool like that. Oh, yeah. I was like, fuck, that's so cool. That 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 <laughs> I love this sequence. Uh, it obviously, crazy. it ends with them shooting themselves. I was like, what is happening? This is really cool. Um, I just was like, kind of like hoping someone had just hacked the computer. Actually, what I thought was going to happen was they were going to be like, nobody can find us. And then it was going to cut to the, uh, the outside of the thing and Ethan was going to be hanging off the <laughs> submarine. <laughs> I thought I, that's what it was I mean, happen. yeah, when they were like, a tornado's on its way, it's going way fa- or a torpedo's on its way, it's going way faster than it should be. No, it's not it's a torpedo. Running. It's a cruise <laughs> missile, motherfucker. <Nah. laughs> like, right. and cruise they, missile! They look outside and it's just, it's just Tom Cruise in a pod. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I honestly thought yeah. that's what it was going to be. I thought they were going to be like Arctic gear. But uh, the cruise missile was never there. And neither was the enemy, uh, or the torpedoes over there. Neither was the enemy ship. It was all just well. The, our in- our instruments never lied. Well, they did today. It was a ghost in the shell. That's as cool. They call it. So fucking. Sorry. Uh, they end up accidentally blowing themselves out of the water, and we end this scene with the two keys, one of both of which sandwiched together to make a cross. Very biblical. I don't know if you guys caught that at all, but they beat you over the head with these little crosses, like, and it even looks like a like an old school like ornate yeah. cross that you would see in a Catholic church. Um, and off we go from there. A little, to, did anybody, because uh, I turned to Avery while we were watching this, so I was like, oh, this is relevant. In yeah. This. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how this timing. is going to Oh, the submarine the sinking? Yeah. yeah. That was uh, rough. That was rough. I mean, I, I think it's far enough away from the real life well, re- yeah, reality like, of the Titanic it's thing. It's not coming out for weeks, so it's not going to be like hammered into everybody's brain. Fair enough. Fair enough. That was unfortunate, though. Um, 
Uh, from there, we go over to uh, a, a very mysterious building where Ethan Hunt now lives. He just lives in the shadows of this building. This brings me to criticism number one. Why are all of why are they the, the most depressing people on the planet? The IMF team. They're just sad shells of what they used to be, and they only live for the work now. Did we establish that after Fallout? It's the Fallout of Fallout, right? Was it the Fallout of Fallout? I mean, yeah, I, I, I totally buy this. Like, especially after like everything that went down with his wife and yeah. like just how it all is. Like, yeah, they only have each other at this point. He's oh, that's so sad. I just, I like the days where it's like, hey, we wrapped the mission. Let's go out. Hey, Ving Rames, let's go out for a beer and get you like reinstated into the IMF. I love all that. You can only be disavowed so many times. I guess so. That's um, a lot. <laughs> but it is weird to me that the IMF is like now a ghost organization within the NSA, within the CIA, within the national security. You know, they don't even like even the head of the security agencies for the entire United States doesn't know what an IMF is. That's weird to me. Like, what is it? That's Stands cool from- shit to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It just kind of, to me, it limits the the... It limits the the stakes of the movie because it's like you don't really have that much to live for. If this is just your entire life for me. I liked that Ethan was like struggling with trying to have a real life and that these were his friends and that we saw them in those moments of like it's not all about this. There are those moments of like rea- like realness and levity. But in this, literally the first time, we, I'm like, what happens when the mission is done? Does he just go back to that little corridor that's a shadow and just stands there until another for the greater good? And, yeah. Until a DoorDash guy delivers another package to him? Anyway. That yeah, was, it's, it's for the greater good. Look, Fast and Furious can only pull the family card. How many times more are we going to accept the family card? And most people gave up already. It was cool the last three, four times. You know what I mean? But like, you can only... I, like it, the Fallout of Fallout was that all of that is gone. And I don't think you can bring back that sort of vibe anymore. The characters are where they are because of what happened in the last movies. And... I think there is still levity amongst the characters when they're kind of talking and chilling out together on the mission, but I don't think you're ever going to see him at a Schlotzky's hanging out again, you know? <laughs> well, but like, what was the fallout from Fallout? A nuclear bomb went off in the middle of nowhere? Well, just like having the, his wife, like, understanding that that's gone. like that. You yeah, but can... that we knew that from before. We knew that when we saw her across the park in San Francisco when the, the other nuclear bomb went off in the... <laughs> <laughs> There's always bombs going off. Remember when the bomb landed in the bay and they were like, Luther had to go get it. We see her. We know that he can never go back to that. And I mean, that it's was like, like the, the main ago. villain from Fallout. Uh, what's his name? Um, the blanket on both the actor's name. Andy, and, give me the... And, Cameron Cavill? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Like Ethan, big Ethan. Guy. Yeah. Ethan Hunt. Ethan Hunt. Ethan Hunt. Uh, yeah, I forget oh, yeah. his name. But Lane. Like, I, uh, yeah, I feel like the like the mind Solomon tricks Lane. and the, 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 the I'm fucking with everything you sure. love elements of that. Like, that's what leaves you here. Of like... He's now reckoning with death, everybody. And it's like, what's he living for? And I feel like this movie very firmly is explaining. He's living to protect everybody. And I imagine that the second movie is going to be him really coming to grips with, do I need it? Does this actually fulfill me? Or should I either die or figure something else out? Yeah. I hope they don't kill him because I don't want him to go the Bond route. I guess I just, it's just a disappointment for me because I like seeing some of these secretive agents. Like, it's like Bond, right? Bond still like faces very similar aspects but can still come back to reality and like be a part of quasi life and can have somewhat of a life and that way when we take him out of that life it feels special when you don't to me when it's like when it's just all about that i don't know the character becomes a little bit of a shell of himself Mm, um i feel like it is more almost like batman and bruce wayne of like you have this like duty to protect this city you're trying to live your life but you can never fully live your life because you're hiding this thing and and there's a struggle in that right and that's interesting, but in this but one, it feels like he just gave up. He's just Batman. Well, yeah, just Batman and I now. think yeah. he's, I think, I don't know Batman that well. Let's just be totally You're right. fair. You've nailed it. Um, You're totally right. But, like, I think that this is the path where he just chooses to save Gotham and not have a life. Fair. Did you all think we were going to see this uh, the Uber delivery dude again? A hundred percent. Very weird. I thought, I thought he was going to be part of the team. I thought he was going to shoot him. I was like, why is it? It's so weird. That was another weird thing. The guy's like, you got to say the code. And I was like, is this this guy's like, I know it was his first day, but like. This is how poorly they train. The, the, the best of the best IMF agents. How this guy make it onto the team? He can't even remember the code word. You know what I'm talking about? It was weird. Anyway, say la vie. Welcome to the MIF. This is a bookend because obviously she accepts it, you know, later. And it's Haley Atwell gets, gets uh, I want to say, indoctrinated into the IMF. Because at this point, they're more like a cult than they are anything else. But he gets 
of course, another mission briefing. We, we got to have it, right? We've got Kittredge voice coming back, which is oh. awesome. Hell yeah. It's so disappointed that Kittredge ended up being like the big baddie in this. Because I was like, fuck, I love Kittredge running him. I loved that dynamic in the first one. Joey asked me, she was like, wait a minute, was he the bad guy in the first one? I was like, yes and no. Yeah. But that's Kittredge. Right? Totally. He was hunting Ethan. And, but he had a good reason to because Ethan got set up by Phelps. And Phelps, you know, everyone thought Ethan killed his whole team. So Kittredge. But then, of course, Kittred's a dick. Anyway, very complicated. But Kittred's like, should your mission, should you choose to accept it, is you have to go find Ilsa Faust. She has stolen one half of the MacGuffin, and um, you got to go find her in the desert. And, man, we don't waste Before any Before the bounty hunters get her. Before the bounty hunters Before get her. Before the bounty hunters get her. And right. then, boom, we get fucking titles on main. Fuck it. We're not yeah, saving this yeah. for the credits. No. We're doing it right goddamn now. Right. And there is nothing, nothing I love more in a movie than when they treat it like a TV show. And we get the fucking theme song. We get all the actors. <laughs> montage. We get a montage of the movie we're about to yeah, see. Every man. time I love you know Mark how balls you have to have to be like, fuck it. We don't give a shit. You're going to be spoiled. Yeah. You're about to get hyped out of your goddamn gourd. And they've always, they've always done that with yeah. Mission Impossible. Done, right? and, yeah. and that's kind I of the thing. It. I love it, man. It's and so I, good. It it's hit. Good. So hard. I think it was the perfect tee up of the should you choose to accept it? Boom, you hit it with this shit hype version of the song, and then it transitions into uh, it transitions into the desert sequence, right? Uh, oh, where God, son. incredible, but this is this is the this scene was interesting to me because there's a lot of moments in this movie where they're like, we're just going to show a character doing something and play this incredibly, admittedly, in insane soundtrack over the orchestra score to, this, score to this was great. But there's just moments where it feels like they were like, well, we had a couple more things we wanted to do here, but we don't really have that. So let's just show this grand, this beautiful cinematography and get the character over there. This whole thing kind of went by in a, in a very weirdly loose fashion for me i loved it this to me is the grounded shit i was talking about of like they're in the desert when we see tom cruise with a horse laying laying on. down <laughs> that was yeah. cool and then he like gets up and he's sneaking it's metal gear it's yeah phantom pain like yeah. it's specifically metal gear solid five getting in there the sandstorm starting and it's fucking uh I, I, isla I, ilsa. 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 ilsa ilsa there uh, putting her with eye the fucking patch. eye patch oh like God. Dude, it's just, it's so cool. And I thought there was so much purpose to everything. And like, sure, it wasn't like the most uh, intricate, like choreography in terms of like fight and stuff. But I thought it was intricate in terms of a grounded, y'all are in a sandstorm. She reveals the big ass fucking gun. Like moment to moment, the pacing of the scene, I was just like, I'm fucking in. Yeah, I'm, I'm just the opposite with you. The pacing for this was just, it was weirdly loose and all over the place for me. I wish it, there had been more setup to it. I wish that it had been choreographed. I wish that we... Everyone wasn't dressed exactly the same and had face covers so that we could actually have, figure out who was whom the entire time. Not that I had that hard a time tracking no, that's it. A, yeah. But that's we, you don't have any visual identifiers here. And there's no tension in a scene that just yeah. starts, is already at 100%, and then ends, and then that's it. I still enjoy it, but I had issues uh, not knowing who we were focusing on. And it's, it felt like at times the direction was to make us think that there was somebody else amongst this group. Yeah. So I, I kept I thought, thinking that, yeah. like, aside from Ilsa Faust and aside from Tom Cruise, there is somebody else that, that we keep focusing on this one person with the mask. But should, And I'm watching, I'm like, well, maybe that's just another person with another mask, and I think that that's somebody important. But they kept, like, showing somebody that wasn't either of them, and that made me think that there was well, more to the scene. They showed a female because it was, that was the body that decoy they used. Body. The decoy decoy off the oh, no, but, like, I didn't see the hair. Like, I'm not... I never recognized that person as, like, another woman. I right. just recognized, like... Oh, those are like it was the goggles different... and the, the yeah, like, right. balaclava. And they yeah. showed that several times, and maybe that was just their way of showing like there's a lot of different people here. But to yeah. me, it made it seem like so. I'm thinking like, oh, who's this third person going to be? And like that thing never is happened. It Benji, is it? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah it's so. the first body. I feel like when uh, Ethan walks into the room and it, they cut to that face, I'm like, oh fuck, may Ilsa die or something like that. And then you see her on the floor. I'm like, oh fuck, well, then who's that other person? Yeah. And like, well, who am I? Am I supposed to care about them? Or are they just someone random? So I felt like I was, my brain was trying but to. But the gunfire, like uh, the the sound design in this whole sequence <laughs> was just so top tier. The this wind of the sandstorm hitting you, and then um, I just like the kinetic energy of those gunshots and Dolby. 
I think this is like the best sounding Dolby movie I've ever been in. Dude, I, I can't believe I didn't say this at the top. When we got our invites to this, I when we walked in the theater, I was so bummed that it wasn't IMAX because I was like, I want to see a Mission Impossible in IMAX. I'm I walked into the IMAX on, theater. <laughs> assuming. It was just like we assumed it was. And I was like, it's Dolby. And I'm like, I can't be too mad. It's Dolby. I ask you, if you have a Dolby theater, Watch this movie in Dolby. This is hands down, yeah. hands fucking down, the best Dolby mix I have ever heard. I have never felt sound like this. I don't know what they did to tune the bass of like every single fucking thing. The impact is so clean and like everything here, every gunshot, I was like, this is perfection, man. They are at the top of their game. Yeah. Agreed. That was incredible. Um, of course, that we get the firefight, yada, yada. He walks in, sees Ilsa dead, and we're meant to think that she is dead from there. We cut over to this big old hangar. I like the setup for this scene a lot. Everything's got to go analog because this AI is taken over. We have to go analog. I like the CRT TVs we're going to see later. All this stuff is cool. We get Carrie Elways, and I'm like, okay, he's going to be the sort of new Kittredge. We don't know where he's going, and he is. He goes into a room full of other people, all notable actors that you've seen in many in things so before. Cool. We get Warlock. We get uh, uh, the, the, the Viper's wife from... Um, Game of Thrones. Uh, yeah, from Game of Thrones, who I know from a Human Target. She was great in that show. Uh, but we get her, we get Warlock, from, um, and we get Kittredge. We get the big reveal that Kittredge is still there. Still looking good, that mm -hmm. Kittredge. Looks great. Um, while that's happening, this... The, an the analog stuff doesn't happen, though, until after he's kind of informed about all this. AI. That's much later, but, right, but he was saying that as, oh, as he's walking through it. the ranks of people, they're like, we're scrambling oh, to get people all on of the our typewriter. files down, yeah. right? That gotcha, gotcha. Which was, it's interesting, right? All that stuff that's is cool. very, very interesting of what is, what, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with something that can infiltrate every digital system? You got to go analog, you got to go old school. They make a big stink of that, too, with the comms and all that stuff, which is cool. Very fascinating. Uh, meanwhile, there's a blonde guy that's creepy looking. Who's uh, got a strong jawline? Who's sneaking through security? I'm like, this guy's the bad guy. Look, folks, say hey, hey, I know you're watching. Okay, you're trying to recruit me all the time. Yeah. Hire me. I'll point to the bad guy. I know the bad guy, right? That's the bad guy. <laughs> or do I, ladies and gentlemen? Because he literally goes, Mr. Kittredge. In pa oh, first off, so this is the scene I was talking about. This whole sequence is just like paced out. This so is the most cool, Metal Gear sequence, huh. and I've only ever played. I only I watched Jeff Haynes play through Phantom Pain. For like seven hours one time down in LA. And I was like, and, and I was like, this is as Metal Gear as it gets. There it, it, it it's like a stage play. They're all face toward the camera, they're like posed in a specific way, and they're saying lines that feel like somebody wrote them in 1995. And it is a lot for me, but if you're a fan of this genre, I'm sure you liked it a lot. For me, the pop of seeing Kittredge just kind of in the know works for me. And then of course. You got, I got to hand it to the uh, Vicky Vale sitting in the museum, opens up the president, and it's a gas mask <laughs> moment because he's like Mr. Kittredge, hands yeah. it to him. And no not, one else notices. Yeah. Well, Nobody I, else notices. But I, I do, I mean, because it, it just looked like he's handing him a random thing. It didn't yeah. look, it's not this, for audio listeners, it's not this like very obvious <laughs> gas mask that people use in like. No, but know, it had the it, thing that pins you out. Know, yeah. It's like it just, fucking Phantom Menace. It, little it, going down to Naboo thing. Yeah, it is a, such a cool little Naboo. looking device. And it's just such a, in a very sort of subtle way, he goes, hey, Mr. Kitchens, here, here you go. And it's like, he may as well be handing him a fucking sandwich for lunch. Yeah. Right. Well, and grabs this thing and looks something. at this device and is like, oh, sh oh my God, I and need to put this back. mask on. Wait a second. Oh, so cool. Puts his mask on, has sunglasses on too. And that there's a hero shot of him yeah. where, where Kitchens is looking up at him and you can barely see him through the smoke. He's got those badass circular sunglasses like looking down at him. So fucking Metal Gear. Anyway, throws the thing. And this scene, this the blocking of this, the choreography in this was awesome. Because he throws it and boom, and everyone's just knocked out. You think Green they're, de you think they're dead. Green gas. Again, another random kind of, in my brain, nod to like, are we watching a low-key Joker movie? Because Palm Clemente could be for sure Harlequin. I, I digress. <laughs> uh, the smoke dissipates. He takes the thing off, and he's like, what's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And boom, the reveal that blew my mind. It's not. It's actually Ethan Hunt. And he's there to Gets be like me every time, you know. <laughs> We're every such time. simple people. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's cool. It's it's they've I'll, established I'll, this is technology in this universe. They're using it properly. I'll say this: the only thing that could have been cooler was if this dude was a villain. If it wasn't Tom Cruise the whole time, and just this dude looking the way he does with his fucking circular glasses and the gas mask, if that was just the guy that like oh shit, this is the actual villain starting off the whole movie, and if we had him instead of uh, the guy who Gabriel. played Gabriel, like, I just loved the look and the, the, the was, demeanor the of this guy. The design was really cool. Yeah, yeah. I like, I, I, I thought the only thing that was, that could have been cooler than the mask being pulled off, and we love, and I love that shit, trust me. 
I, I like if I just loved the idea of this guy being a threat for the rest of these movies. Well, also very scary that he just like we have this council of, you know, security people who just got all wiped out. Yeah. I love that. I was like, oh, my God, he killed everyone. That's fucking awesome. Oh, they didn't kill them, though. I know, but I thought that. Oh, OK. Gotcha. You know, right, right before he takes the, his face off, I was like, oh, they're just knocked out. I thought he killed everyone and was going to use ki- and like kidnap Kitris or or blackmail him or do something. I was like, dude, this where the hell is this going? I do want to give a shout out to an Easter egg. Did you guys catch it at all? In this, I don't know. right over Carrie Elwes's head, like right behind him, I think was a picture of Angela Bassett. Oh yeah, who was oh. supposed to be in this movie? Yeah, oh. um, due to some COVID protocol stuff, uh, she ended up not being able. To I would, yeah, oh, I'd be willing to bet so she was cool. supposed to be in this scene because I think she was like the head of yeah. NSA or something like that back in the other movies. Right? It's so funny to she see was her boss, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, in these movies, because my like current touchstone for her is this like shitty Ryan Murphy show that she's on called Nine One One. And I'm like, how are you on that every week? But then you're in Mission Impossible. Like, I don't under- like Because she can do whatever she wants. I know. It's so <laughs> cool. Okay, have you seen Wakanda Forever? Yeah, I, yeah, I know. There's Incredible. so many things. I'm like, how? I just don't understand she's how she's that good, but then does like a shitty weekly procedure. I mean, everyone <laughs> likes to go, just go to work. Okay, just really get some craft service. True. You know what I'm talking about? Like, you gotta have, you gotta have some stuff on the, on the calendar or else you start getting bored when you're badass. Uh, I digress. He's like, look, this is what's been going on. Uh, uh, Ilsa's dead. And he knows better than to tell anyone. And then we cut over back to Ilsa. And she, guess what, guys? She's not dead. She's alive. The, so they, they, yeah, they, they faked her death. They shot their way out. And he was like, you got to disappear. What's going on? She gives him the key. We're establishing that. There, here's the deal. There's two, two sides of this key. Uh, there's a buyer that's going to buy one of the keys. Uh, you have to go broker this. I'm going to go broker this deal. It's going to be over, I think, in Abu Dhabi. I want to say. Uh, I forget where the airport was, but it's a badass airport. It's so cool. tight. I also love. I just want to give a shout out to whoever does <laughs> Shout out to the guy that designed this airport because the top of it looks like the sand dunes, and that's Dude, really yeah. pretty yeah. cool. When we see that shit, I was like, fuck, this is awesome. I never expected we see Tom Cruise run on it. But then we, <laughs> we should have known. We should have fucking known. Yeah. One of the rare but funniest beats of comedy in it where he's like, Shake was like, where did he go? Yeah. You see he's running in the back. Oh. He's so small. I, just I love the, stuff, the, the setup of the, the buyer, the seller in the airport and all the shit. Like, I was just the I deep was fake rawled, man. All I that. loved yeah. this. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm always a sucker for all this stuff, too. I'm a sucker for multiple teams trying to find multiple people. I just felt like this scene was too many people to keep track of. And right off the rip, again, it's it's. I hate to bring it back to Fast and Furious, um, but that was the main criticism of my Fast and Furious. I had too many people, not only too many people, too many redundant roles in the movie. And when you have too many redundant roles, you don't need two tech people. If you have two tech people, what is the first tech? You got to come up with all sorts of things for the tech people to do. And Benji and, and Ving Rams have always skated that line where they're they're both the tech guy. Um, and that's why they've, they they sort of have to you know find something fun for him to do. Anyway, I digress. We we're also introduced to uh, Gabriel in this who i will say i think might be one of my least favorite antagonists in the entire series my thing with him is i agree but i i also am convinced that he's not really real so, so that's great like, oh, so here's a great point right i think that's not i think i hear what you're saying and i thought that for a second i was like it's gonna be a, like a robot but i think the direction is what killed his performance i think they were like you need to be robotic you need to be like a machine because you are beholden to the machine. The machine is like your is your boss, and he has taken on those traits, which I don't necessarily think was the wrong way for him to the actor to play the character, because it's an interesting take. It just didn't work for me because he comes off being wooden most of the time. Yeah, I, I totally see that. I just don't see him as the bad guy of this movie. I see the AI as the bad guy of this movie, and I see him at he's best being controlled. as a henchman, but at a potential theory is he's not real. <laughs> Like, I, just period. I what think, do you mean by that? I, I think, don't know. But, like, the, <laughs> fact, the fact that it's, like, the amount of, like, the ghost talk and the fact that it's a character that we actually don't know from the past and the fact that the multiple times we only see him through tech. We don't actually see him in real life. There are there are some moments where the we do. Top of the train fight, yeah. right? Yeah. So there are things where I'm like, he's real, so I don't know. Like, it does blow a, put a, a pretty damn big hole in my shit. But this is part one of uh, part two, man. But could he just be wearing some mask thing? Oh, exactly. Yeah. We literally know that you can make human body, like, skin and shit. So it's like, I'm convinced that it's either he's AI, it's, that he's not a real person. It's I, interesting. Go ahead, I, I think the one thing I don't like it, uh, the main thing that kind of turns me off about this villain is the fact that it is somebody from the past that we've never seen or don't really have a connection with, but them trying to really drive the point home that this guy is a badass and you guys got to really watch out for him. And, and Tom Cruise yeah. does a, 
no, he doesn't really care about inflicting pain. He cares about the suffering afterwards. And like that can only work so much um, because like I need to I need to see the evilness and I have to I, I wish I had that connection of, oh, my gosh, that's that one girl that maybe it's a. Uh, Oh, that, that was actually that Solomon Lane that I'm thinking. I was going to say a lot of the things that you're saying, a lot of your criticisms, they actually saw with Solomon Lane. Yeah, even even Ethan being like this guy's yada yada yada. How they set him up is exactly this character. It's just we had two movies. We saw him kill the girl in the record store, which yeah. we liked because she was like a new person, and and Ethan had that sort of like that mentor vibe with her, and then she immediately dies. And then we have two more movies or another movie and a half to see Solomon Lane actually do bad shit. And blackmail people and put them into the and put Ilsa into this horrible situation, which is fucking insidious. But instead, they just tell us that Gabriel is bad, and we're just like supposed to believe us, believe him, right? Yeah. And so driving home, Barrett was like, "So was he in? Like, I don't remember. Was he in part two or part three? I was like, "No, he's actually made up." And those like were just old shots of, like, I guess a young deep faked version of himself. Yeah. Well, they had AI. dyed hair. He's AI. I'm telling you. He's, yeah, I wish they brought back Sean Ambrose from Mission Impossible 2. <laughs> Remember that guy? Uh, Tim, oh, yeah. I, Tim, that is like uh, that is like best case scenario for me. I think I only think because it's the case. Just because I love stupid shit like that. That that you know you, what you were watching the whole time was a lot. Like oh man, disinformation. But, we showed you a movie that like I don't know. I just love that sort of vibe. That could have been cool, but if if he literally physically <laughs> didn't fight him, now we've got we have to deal with like this like a, an android of some sort, which I think could be potentially a little too far for Mission Impossible's believability of what they've set up. I'm not saying they couldn't do it. I believe in Tom Cruise. I think it's more interesting. I think the meta commentary is more interesting this way, which is that he's a slave to AI. He's a slave to technology and he can't get away from it. And there are moments where you're like, is he enjoying this? And there's brief moments where it, you're like, oh, maybe he's actually like not enjoying this. Maybe he's just a slave to this machine and he has to do this thing because he's trapped in this just like everyone else. Meta commentary being, we're all, you know, we're, we're all trapped in technology. It's going to kill us, all this stuff, which it probably will. I, for one, of course. Welcome our Uber overlord. Uh-huh. Thank um, the AI. I think they're just gonna, you know, I don't I don't want to work anymore. So AI do I your get bit. it. Yeah. Do what you um, do. But either way, I just felt like it wasn't very compelling to watch his character. And I think that's another criticism I have is that the world ending AI battling that can wear thin very quickly because a lot of the things that are done in Mission Impossible movies by the bad guy to the protagonists are ridiculous to begin with. Right. You brought you we all mentioned things that we talked about where we we're like, oh, it's so scary when he takes over his comps. So what you're telling me is it's really scary when 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 something in the Mission Impossible universe looks and acts and sounds like something else in the Mission Impossible universe. Well, guess what? That's a hallmark of Mission Impossible. We've seen that multiple times. It's much more fun to watch a real human being do that to another real human being. That to me, that that creates way more, way more tension than just this nebulous. Uh, 1998 Windows 10 screensaver that's that's just kind of going and doing some weird business because it just feels like there's no way to there's no possible way that they could beat this thing. So why I, should I care? I I feel like we've seen six movies of that, and I like that this is doing something different. And I, again, we need to see the part two to really bring it all together yeah. and nail it. But I think in this part, I it's not just the Benji voice stuff. I feel like it is the the fear of seeing them all in the typewriters of like yo this like they tell us and show us what the AI is doing. That's not just this omniscient omnipotent present that can do whatever it wants it's like oh no it's doing stuff and it's learning and it's getting better at time like at times to itself mm -hmm. and i feel like that's the thing that's interesting to me where it's like there there is a real actual villain there that at a certain point it is going to be if it's not already better than all the government agencies ghost or not mm -hmm. but yeah. I don't know, it worked for me but I, I get it that it was a little weird and like him real or not like not the most engaging he's no solomon lane that's absolutely yeah. sure. and i'd say like the I, I'm totally uh, down for this concept. I, I love the idea of the evil AI. I don't think it was executed as well as it could have been. Uh, you know, there are some pretty silly lines of, uh, you know, Luther. You're playing four dimensional chess with with a yeah. with a whatever that. Like, there's a lot of like, do what you wouldn't do. You have to think of like. Yeah, I that, hate that. I just I, I wasn't a huge that. fan of uh, a huge fan of those lines, but I am a big fan of uh, any. Uh, of the potential of what they can do with this in part two and what the potential of like mind games and tricks they can play with the characters and us, the audience as to what this AI is capable of. And we'll see. And we'll, again, a lot of this is set up for part two. That's right. We'll, we'll, we'll skip ahead here in, in the plot. Where did we leave off? Oh, right. You've got to go to the airport and find the buyer. Um, at this point, 
for whatever reason, I can't remember why. I think it's because I guess Ethan's disavowed again. When is he not? And Shay Wiggum. think that he killed his whole team again? <laughs> is that again? <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> Who's who died? I forget why Shay Wiggum gets called in. But this is, I, I, I wish this wasn't the case because. Was isn't, it? isn't it that um, he's basically been told to get the key, but he isn't? Like, they, they just, he's gone rogue again. He's gone rogue again, but we, mm-hmm. all, but we set this up. And granted, Kittredge, yeah. I guess, is yeah. double crossing him, so that makes sense. Anyway. I will say, in the room when they're talking about the IMF, I do like when they have he's the like, back what and does forth. That stand for? Like, no, just the, like, you just put out a, like, it's, <laughs> you let them come Love to it. you kind of thing. I forget what the exact phrase was. And uh, Carrie was just like, what do you mean? Like, I, you just I like fucking love throw it. it out into the universe. That that whole sequence, because it starts off with IMF. What does that stand for? And he goes, impossible mission force. And he's like, <laughs> you got to be kidding me. <laughs> and then he goes, so wait, let me get, let me get this straight. They just, you just put it out there and they, ex- they just accept it. And then what it goes, if they choose if they to. Choose to. <laughs> it's great. And I, I, think this, good. I think this movie had a lot of those moments of like, uh, uh, you know, it's not going to beat you over the head with humor, but not only that, but I want to shout out in future sequences that, that we'll get to soon, uh, Tom Cruise's ability to kind of just have fun with humor in ways that doesn't need to be over the top. I love a an over-flustered Ethan Hunt in these movies. In the car, uh, during that little car chase scene, and like, the, uh, we're on fire, we're on fire. No, the car, those are the car tires. We're not on fire. The cars, you know, like... The the tires are, are smoking. Like I just I just love his like kind of panicking but trying to keep it cool. Like any time that he does that in the movies, and it's usually at the it's usually on the other side of it, it's Benji kind of messing up some sort of technology. Right. I just love the timing that he has and the way he plays those scenes and plays with that those dialogue. I'm a sucker for that usually as well. But again, for whatever reason, oh, just realized why I didn't like that car sequence. It reminds me of Night and Day. Did you guys ever see that? No. That's another Tom Cruise. Tom right? Cruise, Cameron Diaz, rom com action adventure where he plays a secret agent and they, they have very similar has a very similar vibe. Like whatever I just why described to you, whatever your emotion was, that's exactly the vibe this movie was. Not very good. I don't know why we tried to put anyone older than young Tom Cruise in a rom com. I just <laughs> I don't but know it's why. Well. Yeah. <laughs> uh anyway, so uh we go to the airport, we've got a lot of cool stuff that happens here. Benji's gotta defuse this bomb. The AI knows who he is, is learning more about him, all that jazz. Uh we get introduced to Gabriel. Gabriel's a ghost, and we see him and and then he's he's there and he's back again and he's gone. Uh Tom Cruise ends up getting away. Um we do have a little back and forth where, where Ving Rams is like, Don't don't tell Ethan what's going on. Let's just so he has to do the two communication things. Um, and then Tom Cruise ends up running again. I think this is like the third time we've seen him run in this. Dude, not mad he at runs it. so much. So much. It's in this. so good. And it, like, I mean, again, that's something we look for in these movies is him running. Vin Diesel says family, Tom Cruise runs. Yeah. And runner. he runs effectively. And he <laughs> runs in very cool places. Yep. And I think this movie, I'm putting up there with some of the coolest places we've seen Tom Cruise run. Later, we get the scene of him running and there's like candlelit like stairwells and shit. I'm like, this is just awesome. Running on this roof. Awesome. awesome and the music <laughs> and the music is so pulsing good. so loudly and so like incredibly uh, like any single again you could put this score over anything and it's going to be inside uh, exciting and interesting and that that's how i felt through a lot of these sequences i think uh, one thing i wanted to point out in my beginning sort of uh thoughts of how i felt about the whole movie is like i i still enjoyed a lot of it despite of what was happening where Maybe I don't really, I'm not really super down with why so-and-so is chasing so-and-so, or I'm not really feeling the vibe of whatever sequence is happening, but I'm still enjoying what I'm watching and experiencing and feeling. Like, I, I, if I had an Apple Watch, I, I would have been getting the same warnings on my high pulse. Because, like, even though I'm in a sequence and I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, I, like, this is just kind of, this is a weird sequence here near the end. But I'm still on the edge of my seat and my body is still tense and like the movie still evokes that feeling out of me. So like that's still like a crazy mark of because uh, usually when that's happening in the movie, I'm sitting, I'm slouching in my chair. I'm like, this fucking sucks, dude. But they're so good at making these movies that like it kind of doesn't matter sometimes. Uh, of course, Haley Atwell is here. Tom Cruise is like, we got to get this buyer. But the, but the, the plan is actually not to get the key back from him. It's to give him their key and then figure out because we don't know what the key goes to. That's the big thing here. We're not sure. Where it goes. 
for sure it's going to be a cross, but we're, we, you know, there's a lot of crosses in the world. We don't know where it's going to go. So uh, Haley Atwell, of course, gets the better of him. She's like, I don't believe you, whatever. We're established that she is a master thief. Uh, she ends up getting uh, getting one over on Tom Cruise. Bye bye through the glass. The goes. Tom Cruise close up magic stuff. It was just so good. so <laughs> silly. I love it so fucking much, man. The little the fucking. It was lighter. so dumb, but I liked oh, it. The, the dude, he's been doing that since the first movie. It's, I love that shit. It's, it's interesting. I, I love that piece of trivia. I think you did for the very first movie where he actually learned how to do that. Yeah, man. And you're like, of why, course Tom? He did. Of course you did. And it the man is Tom. committed to his craft. Yeah. that's why. Is that uh, stunts. That's from it. here, we go over to Roma. Where Haley Atwell lands and is immediately scooped up by the uh, police. Um, he, we get the whole exposition of who she is, and man, she's a badass. She's wanted for jewel, uh, jewel thief in, in you know Paris. She stole, she robbed a bank. She robbed this. She robbed that. Stole my car. She's Texas, the just the yeah. best that there ever was. Of course, they were like, by the way, there's a little paperclip that's on this thing. She does a whole Silence of the Lambs paperclip thing. Boom, hits a guy in the face, tears his face off, wears the face out. Right? And that's no. how she Wrong gets out? Yeah. No? Okay. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> Love the 90s coolness of these shots. Like, why was this entire shot not on them, but the reflection of them in the table? Because it's fucking cool, man. That's why. <laughs> I, I I like Haley Atwell's performance in the scene as well. I think she does, really, she does a really good job of something that was a criticism of mine, uh, of uh, Old Anne Hathaway in The Dark Knight Rises, where switching between that, like, I don't know what's going on. Innocent. Uh, this is a big mistake character to then the, I, this is who I am. I'm actually a badass thief. It's actually pretty hard to do. And I think Haley Atwell does it. She has a moment where she's like, there must be some understanding here. And I start believing her, even though I know. <laughs> I was like, just watch the scene. Right? <laughs> I loved um, her in this movie. I, yeah. I had a good time with her. I, 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 we, again, my criticism, not of Haley Atwell. I just don't think they gave the character a lot to do. I wish, if we're going to unpack this right now, I wish it had been a character that then Ethan, because the whole point of it is Ethan's bringing in a new recruit, but there's a weird chemistry between the two of them, and I wish that just hadn't existed. I wish she had been a character that Ethan could mentor instead of have a weird moment where he's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to crush your face, Haley Atwell, and you're like, why? Why is this any of this happening? To me, that was weird to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I just, in addition to that, I'm more on the, like, I don't like the killing off Rebecca Ferguson. Oh, I hate Replace that. her with Haley Atwell. Like, I hate that. E even if it's not a one-to-one, -one, it, it very much feels like that. It's a one-to-one. -one. The positioning on the poster next movie type shit. In my, yeah. in my mind, I'm watching this, and I, the way that I'm justifying it is, like, Maybe I, I hope Rebecca Ferguson says just because she can't do part two. And, like <laughs> that, that like and that's that's just me trying to like be I mean, overly on, positive bro. about it. But like, yeah, it's a bummer that she's dead because she's been the coolest fucking she's character. The coolest. And, she's a great she's great she's a great actor, great at the physicality of what's going on here. Um and has a lineage in the series. It's it's a very big disappointment for me. Uh anyway. Tom Cruise is the lawyer. Tom Cruise is the the lawyer. Her lawyer. Her lawyer, right. Comes in. Yada, yada, yada. To see the lighter on the table. And she fucking the knows. So she knows. cool. Uh, the lighter, of course, is a Geiger counter that we never use again. It's just a, a lighter, which is cool. Um, she ends up escaping. Well, actually, we meet Gabriel here. And Gabriel comes in to the, to the head of the police. And he knows everything about the police officer's kids and all that stuff. And that he, he stole a Cartier bracelet for his mistress back in the day and all that jazz. And he goes, do you work for Interpol? And, the guy, and I start laughing because his, his – follow me on this one. Andy, did you ever see Lego Batman? Yeah. Do you remember the sequence where um, Will Arnett is talking to Michael Sarah and he goes, can you be quiet? And Michael Sarah goes, when I desire to be. <laughs> That's what this reminded me of. He's like, are you Interpol? He's like, when I desire to be. I'm anything. And he's wearing a little ascot. I'm like, what, what is this character? Yeah. What's happening here? What are we doing here? This is not scary. This is not intimidating. It's just yeah. weird. And I guess this, is, this could have been a moment where we could have seen him like the suffering <clears throat> uh, and not just the pain that they like talk about all this time. But like, he doesn't... But like, but when a character's motivations are just that they're a psychopath that likes to watch people bleed, like, it just kind of gets boring. After and and I, I, I don't think feel like, like Lane at, at least at least Lane right? was like, no, we really don't actually, because no. they set him up like he likes the suffering. I was even like, the Carrie always stuff on the train. He just like cuts, cuts his, his mouth. throat. Yeah. It's not like he does anything like particularly crazy. I, I also, I think there's a a part to his I character. Guess he stabs his hand in this scene. I, I think there's a part to his character that, um, like. A lot of it is is tell and don't show with him. And now I'm thinking about if Nicholas Holt was in this role, surely they wouldn't have had him be the ghost in the past because he's way too young to be a ghost yeah. in Tom Cruise's past. So maybe that was a, char a different character entirely and they had to change the sort of yeah. vibe mm -hmm. of what this whole story was. Like It feels like a very rushed character just kind of shoehorned in there. And also... I don't mind the trope of 
the villain walking in and knowing everything about the person that they're talking to. And that that we've seen it a million times. I'm not like the biggest fan of it. I don't hate it, but it just wasn't done here super well to make me go, oh, I'm even more scared of I'm this scared guy of this now. Guy. Like I that's just something I don't know. It just nothing in this yeah. sequence really made me feel like this villain is really worth fearing. No, I agree. Um, I will say we we did skip over the notion that Tom Cruise was a criminal before he got interdu- like inducted into the IMF as a last chance sort of oh. thing, which I don't like. I don't like that we are sort of, I, I don't know that it was ever necessarily established how Ethan Hunt came in, but we oh, did have the first one where- Unnecessary retcon. It's unnecessary retcon to me, right? Jim Phelps, we, we got from the first one that Ethan Hunt was just a badass and Jim Phelps brought him in to mentor him and then use him and that's the whole vibe of Mission Impossible. So the idea that like, we saw some random, again, another nondescript, way too young for him, uh, brunette, that gets shot. And we're like, whoa. Who's this? <laughs> I think what they were trying to do was they were trying to have the the brunette that's in the pa- flashback look and feel like Haley Atwell so that so that Tom oh. Cruise had some level of like, oh, attachment. this is an attachment to her. But it just oh, stuck out like a sore thumb and didn't really work. And I was just saying, I don't love they retconned, not really retconned, but they kind of retconned Ethan Hunt. As being like an ex criminal that gets one more shot at being the IMF, I'm like no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was just a badass. That was so good. They put him in this super secret, like top level CIA organization, right? Because they used to be part of the fucking CIA, but they're not anymore. Now they're just and disavowed, they're like, dude. disavowed freelancers. Freelancers, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> you got you to find them on Indeed.com, <laughs> Fiverr. <laughs> um, anyway, this kicks off another big action sequence with all the cars. There's some great moments here where Haley Atwell drives away. Tom Cruise chases after her in a police bike. She gets uh, t-boned by Palm Clementine f- and uh, Gabriel's goons. And now this is the first couple times we've seen Palm Clementine. She's speaking she's either zero words. By, and what little, what few words she does speak? All I think French. She speaks in French. Thank you. Yeah. I was gonna say Italian, but I think that no, it was French. French. Uh, which is awesome. But she's like, again, kind of a weird Bond level henchman, which I'm not used to in Mission Impossible. And I know I said that I like a lot of the Bond things in this, but like to me, Bond and Mission Impossible, separation of church and state here. They're two different things. Having her come with the teardrop and all that stuff, like later where we see her in the makeup, I'm like, this is a weird. I vibe. thought that was just her getup for the party. Like, yes, it was. But it also felt a lot like, you know, like in Bond, there's always like something weird about the, not the henchman. It's always the, uh, sorry, not the villain, the henchman. Yeah, silver head. They always have the the diamonds. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, right? That's what this felt like to me where it's like we're trying to distinguish her differently from Vanessa Kirby, who's also a blonde and the other, just too many people. Anyway. I I loved her in this. I like these type of villains. I also like that there's a part two and we're going to get more of her, and I think she can become... Oh, she's still, that's right, she's still alive at the end of this. She can become a real got a pulse. Later. She got, they got a pulse, but, I mean, before we see Palm Clemente, we see Tom Cruise huck a fucking motorcycle. That was awesome. some, <laughs> So cool. Like, the oh fact God. that all that this was all in slow-mo, I think, added even more to the excitement and coolness of it, is you're seeing Haley Atwell in this car, looking all, like, she's she's scared, she's panicked, Again, she's a thief. She's not somebody who deals with, like, worldwide espionage in this way. She just steals shit. So she's not used to, like, action on this sort of mm-hmm. stage in this sort of way. And she's... I know we feel like maybe she should expect something like this, but it's like, well, she's where she's at because she never gets caught. She's really, really That's good fair. at her she's job. She's just supposed to steal this key. <laughs> and so, like, yeah, she's just been hired to steal this key. Who gives a shit? I don't know what the key is, you know? And then to see all in slow mo, she just gets T boned by this gigantic tank. Essentially, the car from uh, the massive car from armored car from Uncharted and Four. Shaw. Oh, sorry. Oh, Mark that Dunn. too. Yeah. Uh, the slow mo <laughs> shot of her star. turning, her, looking to the right, and seeing a slow mo motorcycle being launched <laughs> and taking out two of the guards. Like awesome. It's that beautiful. the ones that were going to try to get into the car. So cool, dude. Um. So this kicks off uh, the next sequence where Shea Wiggum pulls up. God Ethan Freeze, this man, and, I love, I think they ha- and they have what a past. What else is he in? I love him. He's been in. He was in Boardwalk Empire. He was in Fast and Furious. He he's was been in a shitty Death Note. He's been in a ton. Movie. He's always this character who is just kind of out of uh, clueless, but a good guy, but kind of clueless. He's great. That's Shea Wiggum. Uh, Shea Wiggum. Also, we've set up. What, why do you have such a chip on your shoulder for Ethan Hunt? And he's like, you're never gonna understand. Like, why don't you just fucking tell us what happened? Like, this guy's this guy's the guy you're gonna spend the whole movie with. Tell him what happened. I uh, also thought this guy was gonna be a men, like a you know a character that would come into the IMF too because we spent a lot of time with him. But we don't anyway. Uh, shoot off, standoff, palm clemency, stop popping off. 
We go. Ethan gets away. We got to find a different car because that makes sense. They've tried. I guess they're tracking our car. We got to go old school. And and no, get, their car had no doors. They're like it still ran. I mean, the one and it was like an M5. Car accident, though. Yeah, it was looking pretty rough. That's for true. Yeah. 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 Fair. I don't think it's Fair. Driving yeah. Good point. Um, they got to find a different car. We get the fun. We get another fun beat of comedy where it's like Ferrari, something yellow, Porsche, Ferrari. And we're like, badass is going to get in the Ferrari. And nope, it's a little Fiat. It's the world's smallest little tiny electric car, but this thing fucking rips. I mean, but he also just plays it so great of like, Assuming it's a super fast, nice looking car, walking up to it with the keys and then just seeing the other thing pull out. It was just a great little beat of comedy um, right there. Something I want to point out was one of the, my favorite pieces of tech in any Mission Impossible movie is the app that shows you where the, uh, the, <laughs> safe, the, the house, safe house, safe car, and safe car. Safe and he literally goes through, it goes safe car. And yeah. it, got, it scans, it does a face scan for him oh, and it goes buddy. and rots him over there. I was like, just click the safe boat awesome. one. Come on, Tom, give it to us. <laughs> I mean, you, they got, they had a safe boat in Venice, right? With the red leather interior that Benji drives around. Like all that stuff's cool. Anyway, I thought that was really an, an interesting and fun, practical thing that they put in here. Anyway, we get the sequence. And like, I think the reason why I don't, love it is because i'm used to when it's ilsa and tom cruise neither of them are bumbling so they have to come up with really creative ways for the bad guys to beat them them to overcome the bad guys and it ends up being i think an exercise in like keeping everything as tight and 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 creative and inspired as humanly possible this one just feels like a little wacky <laughs> which yeah which I didn't, didn't really work for me worked so hard for me. i worked yeah I, I, the, I them being it. handcuffed and the cars flipping and all of it stuff. So i thought it was just perfect again i actually now that I'm thinking about it, holy fuck, that's why it's night and day. They ride a motorcycle handcuffed. Oh, no, that's Bond. It's Bond. That's what it was. They stole it from, um, from Die Another Day with him and Michelle Yeoh. And he's, she has to ride. She has this hand, his hands on her, and they have to, they have to pad the motorcycle together. Anyway, it I, I, night and day I loved the comedy in this, in this whole scene because um, I just loved the idea of this little tiny car getting into places where the big giant truck couldn't get to. And the escape plan of getting through that tunnel. I, I don't know. I just, I had a good time with it. And um, I feel like we've seen him bubbling in moments with Benji before in other movies. Yes, but stumbling and bumbling are two different things, in my opinion, hmm. right? Interesting. Him going, <laughs> him going, the, the sequence where he's like, and again, it's mirrored in here a little bit, where he was like, you need to go chase after Walker. And he's like, what do you want me to do? He's like, you got to just go straight. You got to go straight. And Tom Cruise looking and going like, coming to the realization that to go straight means I have to jump out of a window, that's stumbling for a second. Bumbling is like, Haley Atwell doesn't know how to drive a car. <laughs> I've never driven a car before. What's going on here, right? This, it, ooh, it's, it kinda, it's like Pink Panther style. It starts getting slapsticky toward a certain I mean, it, me. it, asking her to drive a car and asking her to drive a getaway car while being chased by 20 henchmen and cops Fair. is... Fair. But again, I, I draw back to the point of like, the woman can unlock a handcuff in like three seconds how why are we still handcuffed in this right like she has skills but i i mean i guess to your point she is rocked by all this she just got hit by a car that's fair um i just think that like there's such a thin line between inserting comedy and reaction sequence to to, to help the tension along and then having it completely deflate everything and this one just felt like if you played the benny hill like music behind yeah. it it would have fit and that was very very nah. weird to me also it doesn't help that the car itself looks like a clown car and everything and it's bouncing around a little bit just, this one didn't work for me. You guys liked it. We'll move on because we get a great comedic beat at the end of this where she does pick the lock very quickly and handcuffs him to the, the steering wheel. We were like, duh, I knew she was going to do that. And then instead of picking the lock, Ethan just rips the fucking steering wheel off. There's an <laughs> editing trick they use in this movie that actually works more often than not, which is instead of showing him two split second before the train hits, they cut to him like on the ground. Yeah. yeah. And it actually works in a weird way. They do it three times. They yep. do it here. They do it with, they do it with the um train at the, the train end. where no 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 not the train at the end but the, the moment where he comes through crashing yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. So they don't so set it up don't at all. You don't see the actual landing. Just, and mm -hmm. again, normally that that device and then the train sequence where it, it falls but they're all just standing there. Yeah. That device is commonly used in comedies as a way to misdirect the audience of being like, oh, it's not an action sequence. That's actually, it's a comedic beat usually, which is why it trips me out every time they do it. Mm. We laughed at it when the, when the when motorcycle the hit the guy. Oh. We laughed at it when he came through the train, right? Because it was shocking and it was ridiculous and it was hyper-violent. But had that been in a Will Ferrell movie, if that, if that was John C. Riley banging through <laughs> in a Will Ferrell movie, it would have it yeah. not have stuck out at all. I, I think Very a lot interesting of, use of that editing technique. I think a lot of action movies use that technique, though. There are plenty of action movies 
where they are trying to get across tension in a sequence and it's a person with the handcuff and they're going, oh my God, oh my God, oh, the fucking car's gonna cut. And the car crashes in and it, it oh, and they turn around and it turns out they had already been safe. We were just watching them maybe at two different they do, times. They do it a lot in Mission Impossibles, right? They do they do that misdirect. It's a misdirect, basically. Yeah. Right? It's the, like it I'm about to knock train. on the door and you yeah. see the guy in the thing, oh, he's in the room and I'm gonna, and then the guys are coming with the door and they and they bang down the door and who do they find? They, that MP dude's room. already on the street. The guy's on the street, right? So it, it is used to that, but in this one, it was used very precisely to just do cut out a little bit of the time in the action just enough for it to be surprising, which yeah. I was like, oh, that was actually pretty cool. I, cool. I like that he's just like on the side. I like that he walks out with the thing. I was like, oh, okay. Show me something a little new, a new technique that you don't normally see in these movies. I will say that I'll this allow. is one of my favorite, the comedy things that did work for me is when he's coming out of the train tunnel <laughs> here and he's still connected to the steering wheel yeah. and then he sees a bunch of cops in front of him and he just like kind of turns around and like, pretends to like, drive like, with it. Like, it. Yeah. I don't know what else to do with this. So I was like, Tom Cruise, you, uh, get, you get points for that. Shield his body. <laughs> <laughs> but he uh, just grabs it like, and just like yeah. kind of turns it a little bit. Uh, of course, Benji oh. and uh, and Ving Rams is like, Luther, I forgot his name, uh, pull up and they're like, get in. And of course, Tom Cruise is like, thank God my team's here. Even though he told them, you guys got to go. I got to do this on my own. They of course show up and uh, they come to save him. Uh, and we get... I think, oh, right, this is where we have to go over to uh, the White Snake. That's not our name. The White Widow. The man. <laughs> the White Snake is the joke. Uh, they did, we are like, hey. Uh, <coughs> oh, this is the cool party. This is the cool party. Which, Vanessa fucking Kirby. We got Vanessa Kirby She's in this. so fun. Love her. The I only love thing her. better than her is two of her. We get two of her. <laughs> we do get two of her, one with blue eyes, one with brown eyes. It's like a character creator. Uh-huh. It's, it's weird to me. And again, I know, I guess I'm, I'm getting real nitpicky here, but like, does she only ever exist at these parties? Yeah. Because the first time we see her, oh wait, no, I guess she wasn't in the party in, in uh, they had this type of party at the very beginning of Fallout, but I guess she wasn't in that. I'm going to be completely honest. Oh no, she I, was in she that. Was she was in the back that, yeah. of that. Yeah. I struggled with this because I could not separate her as Mission Impossible character versus her as Hobbs Shaw's Shaw. sister yeah. from Hobbs and Shaw. And like, I couldn't remember the plot points of who goes where or whatever, but it didn't really. Well, I've only, I've day. seen Fallout so many times and Hobbs and Shaw only once. So that, 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 to me, I knew that like, oh, that, that is, um, I'm already blanking on her mom's name. What's her mom's name? Max. Max. Max yeah. That, Queenie. oh, the, huh? Queenie. Queen. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Queenie. <laughs> um, it, this, I think, was interesting. It was an interesting choice having there be a lot of the same visual language as the first time we see her. I could explain it as, like, she just throws these parties and that's how she does business. Okay, right on. But I like that scene way more in Fallout than I do in this one because this one, again, all the characters show up and everyone's just there. And there's a moment where he's like, they were like, listen, Ethan, I guess the scene before this was where, he, where Ving Rams was like, you got to think outside the box, bro. What w It knows what you're going to do before you even got to do it, so you got to do something crazy. So in my brain, I'm like... When, when she puts the key in the guy's pocket, which, I, by the way, I love. I love that she's always hiding the keys on other people and they don't know it's got there. It's really smart. I thought at one point Tom Cruise was going to be like, I got to interrupt this whole sequence. And just like, the key's right there. That, guy, that guy's got the key. Mm. And just fuck everything up. Like, <laughs> blow everything up. I was waiting for something like that. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but instead we get, uh, you know, the generic, I'm just going to punch harder moment here where Tom Cruise waits for the guy to take his eyes off for a second. Everyone punches everyone. Ilsa's there. And Gabriel's like, you got to choose between Ilsa and... Uh, Haley Atwell, I was like, well, I guess Haley Atwell's quote was cheaper, because I guess at yeah, this I point, like this. Rebecca Ferguson yeah. is just too expensive to be in these movies, even though she's a fucking awesome character, and whatever, uh, off we go, we're in Venice, by the way, uh, now. I didn't like very much of any of this. I, I thought that it's the, um, you're right about the punch harder sequence um, of, how's Tom Cruise going to get out of this? He's, he's going to fight them. And it's like, I, I want something a little bit more creative of how he's going to get out of this little situation between, you know, deciding who's going to die right here and right now. Not enough gadgets in this movie. Not enough gadgetry. I agree, Joe. And right. and that's what I felt legitimately on the drive home. It's like, I wish we had one more little set piece of like some cool kind of gadgetry because I always go back to the hallway scene in, in Ghost okay, Protocol. Cool. It's like my favorite ever. Um, but why, this, why was that your favorite? Because it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun and it's silly and it's out of the fucking box. Like, it's weird. Yeah, like why would they need to do this? It's Who goofy. Cares? It's <laughs> and Simon Pegg looking in the camera and freaking out, like yeah, all it, that silly shit. It's fun and it's yeah. exciting. And remember that scene was just all, yeah, no sound whatsoever. It was just the guy look, looked over, little, little, little water little, drop. Beep, beep, beep. <laughs> yeah, beep, beep. all that stuff was really, really, really interesting. And it's like a, it's a hallmark of Mission Impossible. They always have something like that. 
And the very first one where he's like, uh, and his sweat comes off and it's like, uh, and all that stuff. You got to have one of those scenes. We don't have one of those. What all this sort of led up to is I thought like one of the most uninteresting and weirdly shot scenes on the bridge with this sort of Ooh. knife fight scene. I would add. It, it didn't, oh, this did not land for me. Um, and I, I think it was just like maybe how, maybe how it was shot, but also Haley Atwell being like, time to fight knife to knife combat, which like also kind of came out of nowhere for me. Why is it because we just spent the last 30 minutes establishing that she's not an action person? She does not know how to do any of this stuff. I, I kind of wish it was a, I kind of wish that they played with our expectations and expect Tom Cruise to get there to maybe save the day and they're showing us like two different things happening but maybe they're actually at different times and we don't know it and by that time he and he gets there thinking he's about to save the day and rebecca ferguson falls down and oh my god she just fucking died i just you know like yeah something like it that. was just weird seeing like this weird kind of drone shot it looked like it was shot on a set too i don't know it felt kind of odd it, to it me it felt like a set it felt like it felt like it felt kind of low budge and it also felt like the the actor and i forget the actress name that play, uh, i think it's elias uh, what's his name? Oh, Asai Mor- Isai Morales. Isai, Isai Morales. Uh, Isai yeah. Morales. Um, just didn't wasn't didn't get, nail the physicality of the fighting enough. Because when he goes up against Rebecca Ferguson, you're like, oh, she's at, like whoever the stunt person was for that, or if it was Rebecca Ferguson, moves very, very, very well. Um, I just didn't like. I just didn't like it. But again, the bad tension, choreography. But again, Tom Cruise running through the city Dude, with Tom the music. Cruise running, man, I love that stuff. It. And again, this is a sequence where I'm watching. I'm like, I don't love what's happening. I'm still feeling tense. But this whole fight scene of the bridge is just not working for me. Yeah. yeah, it worked for me in collaboration with the running and all that. And I liked him showing up in the same way of like not seeing the expected scenes of shots. I expected him to walk up as she's like falling down or whatever. I like that she was just dead. Like I do like that. I don't like that she died. Though. Yeah, I don't so like, like that she died. Yeah. That's the thing is like I don't like some of the plot narrative points of it. But like I I enjoyed this. And again, a lot of it goes back to this feels like the '90s, but done in modern times. So it's not what we expect from the pacing of this type of mm-hmm. thing. But it worked for me. I understand it doesn't work for everyone. Uh, then we get another weird sequence, which I did not like, which could have been cool, but ended up being very distracting because there was blinding lights being shot at you of both sides of him fighting. Well, actually, this was beforehand. Him fighting Palm Clemente in the weird tiny little hallway, which I was like, this is an interesting concept, but it's going on way too long. It's a little hard for me to track at this point. And it just felt like that could, that was another opportunity to be creative where we just weren't. I don't know. How did you guys feel about that? I mean, that's, I include that in what I'm talking about. The whole thing. I, you I, the bridge I, fight, the run, that. Like, I, I liked it. I thought all those things broke up the, the tension correctly and, like, played well. I enjoyed that sequence far more than the yeah. bridge sequence. Okay. Well, interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's where we are. Uh, Rebecca Ferguson unceremoniously killed. Uh, sad. Liked Elsa a lot. Wish we could have just said goodbye to her and brought her back potentially in a future series or whatever. Um, similar to... You know, where's Paul Patton? I keep asking that question. Where's Maggie Q? <laughs> Tandy bring, Newton, where you at? Where, bring back all these people, right? Why, why don't we ha- bring back half, half of these people? Um, anyway, uh, we're like, well, that sucked. Uh, from here, where do we go from here? Oh, she's dead. Um, this is where we have Haley Atwell kind of come to him. And oh. They take her back. And, and he's like, words. listen, you got a choice now. She's like, no, I just want my fucking life back. And he's like, no, you, go, you don't have that choice. We're all ghosts. We're all doing this for the greater good. This is your life from now on. And it's sad. It's not a good alternative. It doesn't feel like you're joining the Justice League. It kind of feels like you're fucked. This is the le- it feels like a lesser of the two evils, at least it did to me. Of like, wait a minute, she was a cool, badass international superstar that apparently, or, or super thief, <laughs> that apparently <laughs> up like until this point. Going on tour. Sorry, like she's like the Beyonce of the world. Um, <laughs> She's an international super thief that apparently was so good up at this point, she'd have absolutely no adversity whatsoever. She's a super thief. Right. Super thief. <laughs> She's super thiefy. <laughs> <laughs> this interview was worth it. <laughs> so it's unfortunate. But then Benji's like, hey, we all want to be here. I'm like, do you? Like, do you want to be here? Because it feels like very, like Benji, Simon Pegg's character feels very stressed out the entire time. He's not lighthearted. He looks... Like the, like the character itself looks like the, the years of this have just aged him beyond <laughs> his years. I mean, that, um, that's the point, though. Like, I think that literally, like, specifically seeing Simon Pegg look that old and his answer being like, I'm here for my friends. It's like all of that I do think is just like, yo, this got way bigger than we ever. We didn't sign but, up for this, but, but we have to live with this. Yeah, but me being the new character of Haley Atwell, it's not like it's a call to arms. I would look at that and be like, no. But you're the choice. I'll take death. my choice. Then that, but like this looks worse to me. Living death, like it does. They like, look, they like all look purgatory. fucking miserable. It's like I don't know. Maybe death is the, the way out of this. 
or at least I guess that makes sense. sense. Why we're presented that because she uh, she then chooses to go. Uh, she's like, look, we got to get on the train. Uh, the little face thing is douched. Ethan's got to figure out a way onto the train. Uh, but you, Haley Atwell, you're gonna go on the train as Vanessa Kirby's character. You're gonna go as the the white the white snake, uh, <laughs> the white tiger. You learn white snake for me. <laughs> sure, yeah, and a yeah, little white snake. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Ethan, uh, uh, <laughs> my a minor criticism. I, I guess they were behind everyone else. I guess Gabriel was an hour ahead of them. But Ethan's got to ride a motorcycle onto the train. Palm Clementine just jumps off a little. He's just like, I'm on top of this whole thing and jumps onto the train. And then, for whatever reason, Gabriel has to get on the train by getting in a box that's got a breath- breathalyzer thing. Even though we've already established that, like, whatever it's camera's it's around. Oxygen, right? Yeah, but why did he need to sneak on board of the train? in a bo- It's a public train. You know what I mean? It was a cool way in. That's how he likes to travel, like yeah. uh, like a coffin, place? like a vampire. Yeah, that like was Taylor weird. Swift. Is that? Oh, she <laughs> does she travel in a hyperbolic chamber? Uh, I thought it was no, a very odd a suitcase. Entrance. Sometimes when she doesn't want to get like mobbed by fans, they oh, put they her put in her in a, a suitcase. suitcase. I thought it was a For very her odd. Tour, they put her in a fake cleaning cart, and then they oh. roll it out from behind the stage to get her where they need to go. And there's like fake mops and brooms, and it's very that's funny. Kind of hilarious. <laughs> I thought Maybe it was a very odd kind of entrance that. Added to the kind of villainness of the character, but I too was wondering, like, well, is do people do the authorities know what they're looking for and know that he'd be on this? Supposedly, I imagine so because he's meeting with Kittredge, and I imagine it's an extra layer of security, and there's all sorts of things going on. But we did establish that this guy cannot be tracked by cameras, so you know, you think it'd be pretty easy to sneak onto a train, you don't have to sneak on there like fucking Dracul, mm-hmm. but uh, whatever. But I and also like. If the IMF has this like cool face mask voice technology, doesn't everybody? Yeah, or like people does. at this level at least. Yeah. So couldn't you have so, one of those? Great point. Everyone does. Yeah. And we've had not only do they have it, but we've I had guess it for it 20 does years. It's get like goofy if like everybody's fucking pulling off masks every five minutes. Fair but. enough. But again, that's so what we all wear masks too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyone can wear a mask. Mm-hmm. Uh, we kick this off and she's like, great. I got to get on to this. Uh, we're also, we have a great scene where. Uh, Gabriel's there and he goes over to check and, oh, who does he find? It's not Vanessa Kirby. No, she's been knocked out by uh, Haley Atwell at this point. Bah, you know, g- gives her the old knockout juice. Uh, no, he finds Carrie Elways and Carrie Elways just chewing up scenery in this scene. This is, I think, one of like the worst dialogue Man, presented same, scenes of yeah, the entire movie. Kind of very, very villain 1.0 where he's like, we're going to take over the world together. And you got to hand it to him. You're like, this is, a, it's, it's, ve- I, at one point I leaned over to Andy when they, when, Kittredge picks up the thing for the first time, and I go, my precious. Because that's what this feels like. They wanted you to feel like this was Lord of the Rings, the one ring to rule them all. And, and, and it's in, that part of it, interesting. This is an all-powerful thing. If you could wield, but nobody can wield it. That's what the humans don't know. That's what the kings didn't know. Yeah. They, didn't, they couldn't actually wield it. That's why they Gandalf doesn't even want to touch yeah. the ring. Don't he knows. Tempt me, Frodo. Tempt me, Frodo. Um, Good movies, yeah. So he kills Carrie Ellis because he's like, you're the only other person that knows who this is. Oh, I know where the thing is, the ba- the Sevastopol, which is the heart of the thing. We established that, oh, that's how we're going to beat this thing. If we go back to the source code, the source code is what's going to beat uh, the, the, the AI. So we've established that it does have a weakness. Why a machine? They talk about at the beginning, don't they? they yeah, 100%. So we kind of know that. It's not really a reveal here. That Ving Rames introduces the source code. He's like, if we get the source code, we can find it. We can kill this thing. Um, I'm not sure that's how AI works. <laughs> that is that is one weird thing to me because we've established that this AI has evolved. You know, when they talk about AI evolving, they talk about it evolving exponentially to the point where it's like 10,000 years of evolution can happen within like a week of, of AI. And that's a ridiculous number, but you guys get what I'm talking about. Within one year of AI becoming sentient, they're like, here are the things that are going to happen. And it's all cataclysmic. Why this thing wouldn't have figured out that it could just rewrite its source code is beyond me. But we do have to have a way to beat it. So this is the way we beat it. We got to find the sub that's in the middle of the ocean and Carrie always knows where it is and boom, he's dead. Palm Clementif, of course, got saved and the computer algorithm has calculated that she's going to betray them so she gets stabbed and she's like, what the fuck? <laughs> like, now I'm gonna. <laughs> right, it wasn't I before. wasn't gonna betray you before, yeah. but fuck you. Everything was pretty much going the way we wanted it to go, but... I was actually gonna, like, stab Tom Cruise and be like, should have done it right the first time. Yeah, was <laughs> <laughs> uh, she gets stabbed uh, and she's like, uh, yeah. uh, she says something, I don't know. Um... And then uh, from there, we get the Vanessa Kirby uh, uh, Kittredge scene, where she's like, I need you to save Haley Atwell's character. I need you to save Grace. Grace is a good person. Don't tell anyone I did that. Don't, I just, let's not bemoan the fact that Kittredge, who is the head, was at one point the head of the IMF, the head of the CIA, high up in espionage, 
probably one of the most experienced and, uh, 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 you know, storied veterans of the trade craft does not notice that this girl he has known since she was a child has the wrong color eyes. Yeah. And at no point does anyone call any attention to that, by the way. At no point does her henchman go, look up your eyes are brown right now. Did notice that she changed her clothes, but that was the distraction, so he didn't look at her eyes. Fair. Weird. I I'll, will say it's also weird that when they printed the Vanessa Kirby mask, they gave her eyelashes, <laughs> which is like, oh, I wouldn't think that the mask would have like eyelids <laughs> and eyelashes. And eyelashes. <laughs> but whatever. They're very, uh, they're very advanced, yeah. <laughs> shout out to Vanessa Kirby here playing She's really Haley Atwell playing her. That's awesome. Unless it was a real mask. No, wow. I don't think so. And this, meanwhile, the whole time, this is uh, Tom Cruise is trying to find the train <laughs> and trying to get there fast, but right. uh, he misses it. Gabriel like, made like, it go real fast, so real he's, fast. Uh, so all their estimates train. are off. So now this whole time that the rest of the movie's been going on, uh, they're telling, "Hey, you got to get there a lot faster. Here's another route to get to it." Uh, hangs the the conductor by the whistle. Oh. And so we just cut back to that every time, and I'm like, okay. Yeah, playing into his, he likes to see people suffer. So we hang the, hung this guy. They're really trying is to paint it, him. But as he was dead. Is that suffering? You know. But uh, anyway, interesting use of cutting back to him and hearing the diegetic sound of the whistle kind of as a, hey, this is happening. as a beating clock sort of moment. Uh, that thing's going. Uh, Vanessa Kirby has a moment where she goes, shit, do I take this $100 million in crypto or... Do I not? Because I feel like I'm selling my soul to the devil. I feel like I'm, I'm risking a lot more than just my life and that. It's my soul. Um, so she declines it, and he's like, what are you doing? And she ends up stealing the key. We're off. Shea Wiggum's on this train also. Hell yeah. We should, we should say. Yeah. And, his, and his person. Uh, so Tom Cruise is like, shit, I got to get to that train. She gets to this cart. She's about to be uh, cornered. We don't know what's going on. And Tom Cruise is like, fuck it. Grip it and rip it. And Ben's just like, you got to do it. And off we go uh, on the what I'll call the widow's peak. Because that's what I would call this. Cool. rock. <laughs> Uh, and he sends it, just absolutely sends it. Benji, are you sure this is the widow's peak? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> again, we've talked about this. We talked about it at the beginning of this episode. Not my favorite stunt, but still fucking cool. Still fucking cool. Let's stop yeah. for a second. Yo, he really 100%. did this. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Like, this he did cool. this yeah. so many times. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and there are so moments like, even in the setup. I, I just feel like the moment itself, I feel like, was lacking just what I expected. Yeah, the build but, up to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It but, felt like the whole movie was a way to get to this scene. And just like in the lead up of like, I, am I going to be going downhill anytime soon? You know, like, yeah. you're like, all right, here comes the big stud. This is what we've been waiting for, you know? But like him going up the mountain, the little jumps he did, all that stuff, I was there for. I love the back and forth bits. But when we get that shot of him looking up and you see the cliff that he's about to go off and we know that it's it, I was like, let's fucking go. Yeah. So I was so in for that. It's just then when he went, it was just kind of like, Oh, he did it. Cool. But like, yeah. didn't have that like, yeah. oh my God moment. But in again, the behind the scenes, they talk about how many times he went off those little BMX jumps because they built him a course or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's some like fucking crazy number, like 10,000. And it's just like, yeah. I mean, the where man, does Tom Cruise sign the time? He's legit. I mean, he's legit good at riding that dirt bike. Yeah. It's not, those, I mean, that's the worst injury I ever had was riding a dirt bike. I threw my bike, tweaked my back. I couldn't mm -hmm. walk for like two weeks after that, right? Joe, another thing you need to watch is his. Him training for the helicopter sequence in Fallout. That shit was nuts. Because the helicopter pilot's being like, it takes three years for somebody to fly a helicopter like this. And he did it like in three months or something. Crazy. Like, it is ridiculous. My favorite from those behind the scenes things are like all of the, it's like he has a base jumping specialist and a specialist for like every little like t tiny thing that goes into like building these stunts. And it's just like, you are committed. There's no one else that's this level. No I, I do appreciate though, uh, we have a bit of setup where. Shea Wiggum's partner at one point is like, are you sure Ethan Hunt hasn't been doing this because it's the right thing to do? How do you know that he's doing all this because he's a villain or whatever? And he's like, well, because this and this happened. I'm like, well, how do you know he didn't do that because of, you know, like, yeah. you have the, the counterpart to Shea Wiggum kind of questioning the reasons for why uh, Ethan Hunt has been doing this. And then Shea Wiggum kind of starts to understand that because he sees Kittredge on this train and Kitchen's not supposed to be there. And he's like, what are you doing here? He's like, I'm not here. Right. Just fuck it. And then that's when it kind of clicks with Shea Wiggum. I'm like, huh, all right. Yeah, there's some shit. Yeah, maybe you here. were right. One, maybe, one. maybe I shouldn't just be trusting of all this shit. And maybe Ethan Hunt is on the right side, which I thought was kind of like a, a neat little uh, character development there for him to kind of see the other side of things. Uh, Ethan, of course, uh, smashes through the window. It's, it's just great. great. It's just a it's great so moment. Good. Saves her, fights happen, and sure enough, just as Gabriel, or rather the entity, Got the predicted key. the key would fall right by his feet. 
it's a little literal, right? I mean, granted, sure, you could explain it as the entity knew that Ethan wasn't going to be able to make that train and was, I guess you could be like, well, Benji's going to tell him to go off the widow's peak. And then I guess you could tell him that he's going to smash through that particular window at that particular time, knocking the key out of Grace's hand. And I guess you could theorize that that he calculated that it would land at his feet, but I thought he was being hyperbolic. Mm. You know what I mean? I thought he was like, oh, it'll, land, it'll, it'll come right to my feet. But the fact that it was literally, oh, it's right at my feet was like, I'm like, all right, really? <laughs> like, I, this is God tier level. I didn't even I guess, catch that. I really? just, I just like, whatever that line, you know, it's going to fall by my feet. I never really even thought of that line since that was said. So when it yeah. just came to him, I was like, okay, whatever. Like, it's, yeah, it was just, it, it was a little bit of a, a moment where I was like, all right, that was <laughs> a little too try hardy for me on that one. But, he picks it up. Off we go. Uh, he goes, Haley out. Well, you got to go stop the train. It's a runaway train. Shay Wiggum's like, everyone get to the back of the train. She's going to do absolutely nothing, um, which I guess actually ends up saving our lives. I'll shut the fuck up. But because um, <laughs> the train car after train car goes over. Uh, and Tom Cruise gets the, gets the, fights him. He's like, I got to go up and fight this guy. We got to have a fight on the rooftop of this train. We get a lot of moments from Mission Impossible 1 and also from Speed. Shout yeah. out to Speed. Don't forget where it. Where these things are coming in. And we're on top of a train and we're and fighting. And the sound design here is unbelievable, Unreal. dude. Yeah. Unreal. Uh, uh. The sound design with them going into the tunnel and out of the tunnel. Yes. Like, whoa, that was, ah. that was exhilarating Damn. for that moment. Uh, Gabriel times it perfectly. He's got his watch, guy's little smartwatch timer. Times it and goes, I'm about to jump off in night three. After they fight, they tussle. And she comes like, don't, get up, Ethan. I'm like, really? And, Fucking, and come also, on, you know those guys? But also Gabriel falls as if there's no physics. Oh, no, he falls directly down and does not continue on with the path <laughs> yeah. of the train at all. I, I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of that. I wish, like, oh. he, I wish he just, like, fell into, like, water and then boats, his boat, people were there and boats waiting to take him away or something. But, like, I, that, that's the tiniest little part of, like, suspending my disbelief that I couldn't suspend my disbelief for that of, like, the fact that he was just able to go backwards when they're on a train that's fucking, he motherfucker would have been flying off that shit. And, an analog to this is uh, Skyfall. Right, you have uh, Javier Bardem's character who is a hacker and who uses a lot of these same techniques to like basically always be one step ahead of people. Of course, he famously like or not famously, but like he hacks Q's computer and and reverse hacks it and d gets in the systems and blows up this and that. But there's a wonderful moment where he's sitting on top of the um, a ladder in the subway, and Bond's like, "I've it has his gun drawn on him." He's like, "I've got you." He's like. I forget what he says, but he basically is waiting just long enough for the fucking train to come through the wall. He yeah. throws a train at James oh, Bond. Right. That's the kind of shit that I, I want with the precision of my villain overthinking or like outthinking the other person. This was like. This is kind of standard. Kind of just ran its course for like, me. Oh, of course you with have the a car timer. waiting. Yeah. But anyway, jumps off. Interesting. Uh, soon, of course, uh, Haley Atwell was like, what are we going to do? Gabriel's got the key. And he's like, does he? <laughs> and pops it out, and you're like, "Yes, my guy." For audio, learning from for audio her. listeners, Nick did a little sleight of hand thing. Yeah, he was like, <laughs> "It was so cool, man." <laughs> Felt very like Job from Arrested Development. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Haley Atwell doing some sleight of hand too. I liked cool. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then learning. Gabriel has his moment where we all, of course, were expecting, which I expect in every action movie, and I very seldom get it. Well, it's called the Star Trek II Wrath of Khan yell, where he goes, "Hey." Now! <laughs> and it yeah. echoes in the cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> what a weird moment. Because uh, he realizes he doesn't have a key anymore. Of course, they have to stop the train. How do they do it? I like that the lighter comes back for this. Oh, yeah. He put the lighter in his pocket. Yeah. It's like a sleight of hand thing. That's good. Uh, of course, we have to stop the train by uh, doing a little doohickey at the bottom, unhooking the thing, doing the doohickey. The locomotive goes off, or the engine rather goes off, and, and one by one, the train starts falling over. But then, of course, there's bombs on the bridge. Oh, I forgot there's bombs on the bridge. That's right. <laughs> So but, we haven't again, seen this already yeah. this summer. <laughs> Man, and they look exactly like yep. the Fast and Furious bombs, mm -hmm. which is fucking wild. Did you wild. think that Transformers are going to show up in this one? This not time. this time. Not okay. this time. But, no I mean, again, train Transformers. This is the scene I'm talking about where it gets very Fast and Furious, which yeah. I, I fucking love, and I think a lot of it's cool, but it's it starts to lose some of the like charm when it's just video game stuff. I, I, to, like, I grounded. Yeah. I think I maybe liked the sequence more than... than everybody here at this table because it reminded me of just the escalation of the final sequence of John Wick yep, 4. the steps. Where it just became more and more funny and still tense, and I'm still feeling the tension, even though, yeah, it looks very cgi I and we're not used loved to that. Okay. I loved this scene. Okay. Yeah, I'm just saying it like, I, for, if we're going to praise this movie and franchise for being like, oh, man, it, like it's real stunts and stuff, it's like, all right, there's also a lot of bullshit. Yeah, this was definitely not that, but I, I thought it was still kind of paced 
perfectly. Mm -hmm. This whole sequence and, and not having really a whole lot of music and you're just kind of sitting there with these characters and like, are we ever going to cut away and be okay? And it kept on getting worse and worse and suddenly they're walking through a kitchen and there's all like i i, I the kitchen absolutely was this with the, where they had to go away from the hot oil i was like i had okay. the oil Lord and the, the fire and the yeah. fire and all that stuff fun creative interesting cg could have looked better but i'll allow it because we get to a part where they drop a fucking piano on them oh of course and looney tune shit man tom cruise gets to do my third favorite thing that tom cruise gets to do in this one running two piloting some sort of vehicle that he has no business piloting three Rock climbing. Oh, of course. With a little tippy toe. Oh, dude. You know, he puts a little tippy toe. He's so a little good. And he does this one thing, Joe, where he's like, he puts the toe right there. Yeah. And he lifts himself up with, <laughs> with his little toe. And you're like, that's incredible. <laughs> and he gets to do that in this. I love all this thing. Of course, Palm Clementine coming back to save him. And then she's like, she's like, do you remember, do you remember love? And says a bunch of stuff. And you're like, all right, tell us about the Sebastopol. And he's like, what? California? Sebastopol, California? Mm -hmm. what, what are we talking about here? But they filmed the bird. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Is that what they <laughs> Um, and he goes, oh, of course, it's the submarine. That must be where uh, the heart of this beast is that we'll have to go kill. And then he goes, and, he, and she's like, she starts to pass out a little bit. And he goes, shh. And he closes her eyes, and her eyes open back up because she's like, I'm not dead. And he goes, shh, 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 shut up, shut up. Right? Because she's supposed to be dead, but she's not dead. I, that, I didn't breathing. like when he closed Rebecca first in his eyes. That felt weird. That, yeah. that was Anytime he, right? yeah, yeah. He's like, shut the I fuck like up. I know I only have one getaway uh, vehicle right now, the one getaway parachute, but Haley Owl doesn't know that yet. <laughs> he doesn't know. <laughs> but it's funny because that was the plan. Yeah. She's like, that was the plan, Ethan. Also, I should I, I uh, should track the fact that she actually told Kittridge, like, I, I accept. Like, I, I, I want to yeah. be a part of this. Told, um, or he told me you were going to ask me a question. Yeah. And what was it? What, what was the line she says, though? Like, I accept. It was like, was it no, I, accept? Like I choose to accept. I choose, I choose to accept it. That's what it was. Uh, should you choose to accept? I choose to accept. Uh, and then Tom Cruise does what I would say is the coolest fucking stunt in this whole thing. Front flips off the back of the train as the parachute pops yeah. and he rides out. Yeah, dude. That was dope. Come I was on. like, can we talk about that for a second? Oh, Who did that? And Somebody looked, did that. It looked more and more dangerous as he was just coasting down there. And at that point, when you're straight wigging, you're just like, Fuck it, man. Fuck me. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> I just dropped the gun. I'm like, I'm done. I can't yeah. compete with that. That's pretty Can good. <laughs> Although, like, Shea Wig, I'm better hair than Tom Cruise. Wow. Tough. Relax. Really? I've Be careful, hair. Nick. I've had to say a little pompadour thing Be going careful. On. You know, Tim gets the height in his hair sometimes, yeah. and I'm super jealous about that. Uh, from here, we go over. Ben. He lands next to Benji. And Benji's like, yeah, man. We yeah, saved dude. the day again, I and guess. And he just lands so cool. Like, no stumbling. Just, like, fucking walks it off. Nails Tom it. Cruise. Nice and Stop Cruise. Uh, <laughs> and Benji's like, "What? I, I forgot how the whole thing ends. Um, how does it end? Jeez, what are we? What are we at next? Is that it? Yeah, then oh, it's like God. a little monologue about like finding the keys. The only oh only right, yeah, we get Kitchen's monologue, and we get Kitchen's monologue, and then we go, we we look at the sub one more time, and the sub's down in the Arctic, and that's where we know oh, we're gonna bodies. leave off. A little chain dangling. Oh my God! And then boom, part one. Let's fuck yeah. go. And I love it because we got the fancy titles earlier, mm. so we don't get them here, and it's I just it's a perfect end. Like I love that it just it hits with the logo, and it's just like, yeah, that was a goddamn experience, everybody. Mm -hmm. Let's have a damn good time in a couple years when part two comes out. Uh, but before we do that, we got to do a thing I like to call Ragu Bagu. Ragu Bagu. What's up, guys? Welcome to Rad Guys Talk Bad Guys, or as we originally called this, Mission Impossible. You're right. <laughs> we did. You're right. We or did. villain impossible, I think is villain what we call it. Yeah. Uh, number Hi. one, right now, I have no. Joey, we got in our Duffy, okay? Relax. Uh, number one on our list, Lane and Walker from Mission Impossible Fallout. Number uh, two, Lane and Atley from Mission Impossible Oops. Rogue, 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 Rogue Nation. Rogue Nation. It's confusing. No. All the yeah. same. Uh, the fact that I watched them all so close together, I'm like, oh, they all kind of blend together. Uh, number three, Owen and Musgraves from Mission Impossible 3. Uh, number four, Jim Phelps from Mission Impossible 1. Number five, Sean Am I'm Sean Ambrose. From Mission Impossible 2, we put him above Cobalt from Rogue Nation. Oh, from Ghost Protocol. Which Ghost one? Protocol. Ghost Protocol. Yeah. Where do we want to put Gabriel and the Entity? I, I'm calling it AI, and I'm putting it in number four. After, uh, number four would be a right, up, right above o uh, Omen and Musgraves from uh, Mission Impossible 3. Right above no. Philip Seymour Hoffman. Underneath them. So that'd be number yeah, I can't that would be number four. Oh, no, I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. I had, I had Mission Impossible above it. You're right. That would be right underneath Owen and uh, Musgraves. I, so I would agree. One, two, and four. I, okay, I could argue Jim Phelps was more fascinating because he double crossed Ethan. And that was, that's more interesting to me than the sort of stoic behavior of Gabriel and, the, and them trying to tell you how bad he is. I also love John Voight. I don't know I if that plays this I one. would put it over one. I would put it over Jim Phelps. All right. Or no, underneath. 
Jim Phelps. Underneath Jim I'll Phelps. I'll put Jim Phelps above, yeah. So above one and two. Basically, no, above Cobalt and above Sean Ambrose. Yes. So Sean Ambrose is the Tom Cruise lookalike from Mission Impossible 2. Uh, yeah, so above one and two. Sean yeah. Ambrose. Yeah, I think so. I just think Sean Ambrose. I think that works. When you say that. Yeah. <laughs> so, right, who thinks it's better than Cobalt from that one where the cars drop? Okay. Who thinks it's better than Sean Ambrose with the, with the, tur- the one with the turtlenecks? Who thinks it's better <laughs> than Jim Phelps for number one? Ladies and gentlemen, it's going to go right underneath Jim Phelps. And that's going to be your, your villain impossible list. Villain. And now, it's time to rank impossible. the Mission also, Impossible. Can we, we didn't talk about Rob Delaney is in this movie. Just for a second. <laughs> yeah. God so weird. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's time to rank the Mission Impossible movies. Currently, number one, Rogue Nation, a.k.a. five. Uh, number oh, two, Fallout, really? a.k.a. six. Unanimously, too. Yeah. Oh. Uh, number three, Ghost Protocol, a.k.a. four. Uh, number five, sorry, number four, Mission Impossible three. Number Five, Mission Impossible 1, and number six, Mission Impossible 2. Where would we want to start this? I will go first. Can you slack me that so I can see it? It should be there. Right there. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I will go first, and I will put Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 underneath Mission Impossible 3, Ghost Protocol. Close. I'm with Close Andy. Close for me. Mission Impossible 3. Maybe. Was not Ghost Protocol. What? Was Mission Impossible 3 Ghost Protocol? No, I'm saying number 3, Ghost Protocol. Oh, you put it at 3, Ghost Protocol. No, I'm putting it below Ghost Protocol. <laughs> <laughs> Above Mission Impossible 3. Yes. Oh. Sorry, my apologies. Okay, so at you, number 4. <laughs> at number 4. <laughs> so many Sorry. numbers. I would put this lower. I would put this right below the first Mission Impossible. I'd put it right above oh. Mission Impossible 2. I just feel like... Mission Impossible 2 was a hot mess, and this one was just a lukewarm mess to me. Tim, where are you putting this at? I put it at number four with Andy. So above three, but under Rogue Nation, Fallout, and Ghost Protocol. Interesting. I would put it at number five. So in between the two camps, essentially, at this Mm. point. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Joe, you're a big fan of three. I love three. I love three, three too. We do love I like Philip Seymour Hoffman. I think two's the only one I don't like of all these. And and I also uh, re listened to the last little bit when we talked about Fallout just to be like, where were we actually at? We pretty much unanimously voted Fallout or um, Rogue Nation over Fallout. But we all had trouble with that. I think Kev was the only one pushing for Fallout just because he loved the end so much. Um, It's a great ending. Best ending of all time. It's an amazing ending. Yeah. Um, but then, um, Mission Impossible 2, we all hated so much. It was one of the ones that, like, we left. It was at number like, seven. It was at number <laughs> seven the entire time, uh, which is not reflected here because we've caught up. But, yeah. uh, yeah, so that puts, uh, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, um, at number four. So the ranking goes Rogue Nation, then Fallout, then Ghost Protocol, then Dead Reckoning, then three, then one, then two. Um, what about that? Yeah. Mm. Let's see. Fair. I like that we kept it's democratic. Uh, four, five, and six together. I feel like that's kind of what we do in fa- uh, Fast and Furious. Yeah, absolutely. Five, six, I mean, and seven. Yeah. Five, six, and seven. And yeah. I, I think then this is not as good as those. Totally. Like I feel like it belongs in that conversation, but it's just not quite as good uh, at the best parts. But anyway, let us know in the comments below what you think about Dead Reckoning Part One. Um, and honestly, just say something nice. The code word of the day that I want you to leave in the comments mm. is Nick. And the entity. Entity. The entity. And the entity. <laughs> <laughs> it's the entity. I'll put it that. That's the yeah, good word. Yeah. Up to you to figure out how to spell that. All right. Love you guys. Bye. I certainly didn't spell it right.